Okay, uh, we should probably go ahead and get started. Um, at this point, uh, a few days out, um, you know, whatever your to-do list is, I would advise rewriting it in the in the most uh, high priority first, right? Um, so I know it's ideal you want to get through the post reads a number of times, but at some point you really start you really need to start getting to the questions and stuff just so you can get into that active learning phase. Um, what I'll do, I'll post in the chat. When I do my last post read, I make like abbreviated notes. Um, and hold on one sec. And so uh, and they go by week. So these were the things when I was taking the exam last term that I felt it was important. So um, there's the link. Um, so they're broken up by, but it's just a quick way to go through the notes if you wanna look at my notes from last term. Um, so, it, it, and if you're watching the recording, you can access these on the drive under additional resources in the DM folder. Okay, so let's go ahead. Let me share my screen and we'll, uh, we'll get started. All right, Scrubs, Dog Mom. As I said, this stuff is posted in the additional resources along with extra questions if y'all want to get to those, but um, make sure you make those a priority because the more questions you get to, um, the more practice you get for the exam. All right, let's start off with the one carbon metabolism. So um, it was brought to my attention that some of our notes are a little bit different, like the lectures were tweaked a little, but at the end of the day, they're pulling all the questions from the same test bank. You know, they have these tests from terms back that they're statistically relevant. So all of the high yield stuff we point out is the high yield stuff that's going to be tested too. So if it's a little different, don't stress out. Okay, so PKU PKU2, sometimes called malignant PKU, malignant more severe, that makes sense. Now it's not a deficiency of the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase. It's actually a, um, a uh, deficiency of uh, BH4 or this conversion back to BH4 or di dihydrobiopter, or tetrahydrobiopterin as you know it as the cofactor. So you're gonna see a problem here. The thing about this is you use this as a cofactor for a few reactions. So not only are you gonna get the typical PKU symptoms, but you're also gonna see um, some additional stuff that I'll point out. So that's what you wanna know there. And so, yeah, so there's a few extra steps here that we're worried about because that BH4 is used in a couple of steps. So basically you just can't recycle it um, once you get it to BH2 back to BH4. So. You could see here, these are those reactions that we're worried about, they're hydroxylase reactions. And um, so for each of these, there's so like, but for example, the tryptophan hydroxylase reaction, it's gonna end up going down to serotonin and melatonin. Um, so, uh, uh, and me yeah, melatonin and, um, right. So, um, and you could see these reactions here, so. Um, so you definitely want to remember these. Okay, and this deficiency, uh, you, you can get delayed mental uh, mental development and seizures to form. This one isn't super uh, high yield, but you definitely want to take note of it because of the BH4 cofactor. Okay, so we'll, we'll get into the, the methyl donors or the one carbon donors. I heard recently, uh, you know, Sam is uh, takes that, that methyl group and transfers it. So I heard it's pretty funny. They said Sam is a meth dealer. Um, so if that helps you remember that, um, that it transfers those methyl groups, uh, go for it. So we kind of use these, there's SAM, there's tetrahydrofolate, which is where it, um, the folate, where you get that folate trap in B12. So that the methyl group is transferred to folate. Obviously you're going to need B12 for these reactions too. So some of these one carbon problems, we're going to talk about the, um, the problems that develop uh, with the cofactors as well. All right, and so by all means, you don't want to keep homocysteine. Homocysteine is toxic, particularly neuro. Or, um, when you talked about homocysteinuria, 
we're talking about that um, collagen type problem. So these, these people with homocystinuria kind of look like a mar Marfanoid syndrome or Marfan syndrome. Uh, they're long legs, they have limb subluxation. So homocysteine is toxic. You wanna get rid of it uh, with methionine synthase or cystathione beta synthase, right? So, um, right, and we kind of mentioned this too. So inherited homocysteinuria is a problem if you can't get rid of homocysteine and you need folate B12 and B6 for these reactions. So any sort of deficiency there, these are what we're gonna key in on for this, uh, for this lecture because these are clinically relevant. Okay, big star on this one. There's only two things that I know of that, at least that we talk about that can cause megaloblastic anemia. What happens here, if you see these cells, the, the cytoskeleton isn't really strong. So opposed to being a biconcave disc where you get the central pallor, they blow up like this. So they're really large, they're megaloblastic, right? So they're really swollen cells. So two things can cause this, a folate deficiency or a um, B12 deficiency. And we'll talk about how you differentiate the two. But along with this megaloblastic anemia, you also get these hypersegmented neutrophils, right? Multi-lobed, usually neutrophils are five-lobed, but you can see these hypersegmented neutrophils. So um, as for both blood cells, this is kind of an easy one and um, it's, it's good to know. So this would be indicative of megaloblastic anemia. So again, folate deficiency, remember uh, the first thing you should think of with the folate deficiency is pregnant moms, neural tube defects, right? So this is gonna be our first cause of this macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. Again, polysegmented neutrophils, all right? And if you were to look in the urine for, um, for a folate deficiency, you're gonna to wanna to look for the precursor, right? And the precursor is going to be fig glue, right? Remember that if you don't have folate, you can't get fig glue to glutamate. So if that's a good thing to remember, you can see that in the urine for uh, folate deficiency. Now, B12. So somebody comes in, they have megaloblastic anemia, and you have to determine, is it a folate deficiency or is it a B12 deficiency? This is super high yield, but it's, pretty, it's fairly easy. In addition to the symptoms that someone with folate deficiency has, right? They'll have the same symptom as B12, but with B12, you're also gonna get neurologic problems. And unfortunately, even correcting the B12 doesn't exactly fix these neurologic problems. It could fix the cells, the megaloblastic cells, but you're gonna have these neurologic features. So the difference you wanna focus in on if you see megaloblastic anemia is are there signs of neurologic deficiency? All right, and we talked about this before, remember intrinsic factor in the stomach from the, uh, from the parietal cells is gonna bind that B12. It's gonna transfer down to the terminal ileum. And um, then that's where the B12 is absorbed. So you wanna keep that in mind. And we're gonna come across this topic a few times uh, in this review, but it is super high yield. Now, uh, and this is just a little bit more uh, comprehensive way because the strict vegans remember folate comes from leafy vegetables and B12 is going to come from uh, like from meat, okay? So strict vegans may have a B12 problem. They may need vitamins, uh, atrophic gastritis, right? So you lose those atrophic atrophy of the parietal cells. If you lose those, you may not uh, be able to make intrinsic factor. Pernicious anemia, same kind of concept, this destruction of the parietal cells. Again, you're not gonna bind that B12. And then any sort of disease or of the ileum or a transaction or resection of the ileum. That terminal ileum, there's no place to absorb it, right? Okay, so keep those in mind. Again, same sort of concept. I wanna focus on this point too. So um, neurologic manifestations, right? We can identify that it's B12. Now, if they don't necessarily go into that, by all means, if they have an uh, increased level of methylmalinate in their urine, it's B12, right? Because remember, that's that step um, that one of the two major steps, which we'll come to in a little bit, one of those two steps that needs B12 as a cofactor. So this is the precursor in that step. So if you see that in the urine, you know it's a B12 deficiency. They could even go as far to give you this and say, what kind of additional symptoms would you see? And then you would add, you would add the neurologic symptoms to it because you know it's B12.
Okay, so folate, you may see fig with the urine, and then B12 neurologic manifestations and methylmalonate for sure. Definitely know that. All right, let's talk about heme. This isn't as bad. I know the lectures were kind of dense here, but they're not as bad. They're pretty straightforward. So we'll walk through these. This is from first aid, um, but if you rotate it, it's kind of exactly the same image as this, right? So unfortunately, this is one of those pathways where you kind of need to know everything because there's kind of something important that happens at each step, whether it's the cofactors or one of the three major diseases we talk about. So let's walk down it. So we'll talk about ALA synthase. Um, ALA synthase needs, um, needs vitamin B6, okay? So this is probably one of the lower yield of these that we're gonna talk about, but B6 is gonna need needed for a cofactor. If you don't have the cofactor, um, you can't run that first step, that ALA synthase uh, enzymatic step. Um, one of the things that you may not have come across specifically, but they blow it up in first aid is isoniazid. It's, it's one of the first line treatments for tuberculosis. It just, it eats up all the B6 in your body. So if you see anything with isoniazid, you're thinking of some sort of PLP or B6 deficiency, okay? Um, it, it just mops it all up. So keep that in mind, isoniazid. Now, lead poisoning is another one because, well, let's see, we'll do this one first. All right, so, right, so ALA synthase, this, I'm pretty sure, um, y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the rate limiting step of this pathway. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, um, so, B12, I'm um, sorry, B6 used here, PLP. So like, for example, if they said some sort of isoniazid treatment, B6, you just can't even convert it. You can't get ALA, uh, alpha, um, uh, ALA uh, amino levulinic acid, okay? And then, um, so that's the first step. And then lead poisoning is the other one. So um, question wise, so in the in the United States before 1950, in the 1950s and before, uh, lead was not uh, um, outlawed in the in the paint. Okay, so if they ever talk about a kid or a person that lives in an old home, uh, you can think about lead poisoning. And if they ever talk about um, like a kid that plays with his grandpa's toys or something like that. All right, so those paint chips used to have lead in it back in the day. Okay, so we're talking about lead poisoning here. Um, and so the interesting thing here is that zinc is inhibited by lead. So the delta amino levulinic acid can't be converted to uh, porphobilinogen, right? So this is that ALA dehydratase step. Now also this ferroketolase is, uh, inhibited by zinc as well. I'm sorry, is inhibited by lead, the zinc here. So any, any place that you're looking at a zinc as a cofactor, uh, that's inhibited by lead, okay? So that's important to know. So think old paint, that's really the only time you ever see some sort of lead poisoning, at least in the question, why, question wise. Okay, so this is that second step. All right, so now we can look at the three diseases that are important here, the, the porphyrus. Um, so the first one, what you need to know here is not only the enzyme, but the step that uh, the, the precursor that's going to build up, okay? Um, sadly, some of these enzymes have two names to them as well. So while you're making um, HBM, you're synthesizing HBM, you're also uh, um, breaking down PPG, right? So you could kind of name it either way. I don't know. They got in a fight about it or something, so... Um, make sure you know both names. All right, so one of the, if you're looking at the porphyrus, one of the, I think that's how you say it, I might be saying that wrong. Um, uh, one of the defining characteristics of AIP, acute intermittent porphyria, porphyria, is that how you say it? I think that's right, porphyria, I don't remember. Um, one of the defining characteristics is that upon standing, the urine turns black, all right? This is the only one of these where this, this is the only one that's gonna happen. Don't get this confused with the porf porphyrin rings, porphyrin, porphyrin rings. Um, uh, Cause those, when the urine is actually just straight up red, okay? So this one's a little different. The urine turns dark on standing, all right? Red, purple, black on standing. This is a clinical feature of AIP. These do not have the 
porphyrin rings, porphyrin rings, I'll get it right eventually, porphyrin rings. So it's, they're not photosynthesis, they're not photosyn photosensitive, okay? So the porphyrin ring makes these patients, uh, we'll get to that in a second, I'll, I'll leave that for next. Okay, so just remember for AIP, the urine turgen stark one standing, okay? Um, what I wanted to point out here, now barbiturates are used, they're anti-anxiety medications. They look very similar to GABA. Um, I'm sorry, they, they look, uh, the, the, the structure is very, I'm sorry, ALA has a structure that's very similar to, similar to GABA. The barbiturates work on the GABA receptor. So you can't give a person with AIP barbiturates because um, it's very toxic to them because it looked, the barbiturates that are supposed to be binding to this GABA receptor look very similar to ALA. So this is just a thing to key in on the barbiturates. All right, so the next step here is gonna be CEP and we'll go into some defining characteristics of it. So um, this is your porf uroporphyrinogen three synthase is gonna be the enzyme that's deficient. Yeah, these are tongue twisters. Um, now this is gonna be congenital. So these, this one, uh, CEP and PCT, the next one, are very similar. They both have the proporphyrin rings. So the urine in them, they turns red and they're both photosynthesis, photosensitive, okay? The defining characteristics, some that you could point out with this one, it's congenital. So you see this in children. So this is one of the steps you need to focus in on with the age, okay? So some of the precursors that's gonna build up, uroporphyrin one, it's gonna build up. It can be converted to this and that build up too, but you wanna remember this is gonna build up in case they ask, okay? Now look at the, look at the features. Hypertrichosis is like a werewolf, they have a lot of hair. Um, but the things you wanna key in on is that they have this ring structure. So they're very photosensitive and their urine is red, okay? Now, treatment-wise, um, or I just wanted to point this out, that um, again, the UV light, this porphyrin ring, porphyrin ring um, is the problem here. So they're very photosensitive and they also have red urine. Okay. Now, the last one we want to talk about here, the precursor that builds up is uroporphyrinogen <laughs> 3. Um, so this is going to be PCT. Okay, porphyria cutanea tardia. It's just, it's, it's my kryptonite today. Sorry guys. Um, so this one also has the ring. So the urine's gonna turn red and also they're photosensitive, right? But what's different about it is you see this is an acquired problem, okay? Um, and so you see this with chronic disease of the liver, chronic liver disease, maybe hepatitis, some sort of viral infection, or chronic uh, alcohol abuse. So let's go through them real quick. The first one, the ALA synthase, we're thinking a B6 deficiency, maybe isonize it. That second step, the ALA deaminase or the ferroketolase, which is at the end, they are both uh, cofactors have zinc. So any sort of lead poisoning can uh, inhibit the zinc. So those won't go forward. Now, if we go through the next step, AIP, acute intermittent porphyria, porphyra, um, you're gonna, the key thing you wanna focus on is that the urine turns dark on standing. Now, then you get the CEP and PCT. Uh, both of them have the porphyrin ring. And uh, so both of those patients will be photosensitive and their urine is red. The difference is in CEP, C is for congenital. You'll see that in kids. PCT is an acquired problem with some sort of liver, liver disease, whether it be hepatitis or alcohol abuse, uh, likely um, due to some sort of cirrhosis. Okay, cool. So, oh, and this kind of breaks it down, right? I had a quick so, question, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. On this exam, do, you, do they hit at all on the genetics as far as like uh, inheritance? Or I mean, is it sprinkled or is it just like, cause I mean, like as in focus? for this for this set for the, yes, the heme yeah. stuff yeah no i don't i don't think so no i mean what 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 is the i don't even know the lineage is it is aip autosomal recessive or 
I think one of them's recessive, and then two of them I think are dominant. Maybe congenital is recessive, recessive. and the other two are dominant. Okay. Yeah, I don't remember that being super important. I remember taking the clinical aspects. It may be like an extra uh, note, but I, I don't. I don't remember that being uh, important here. Well, but yeah, because apparently we have acid base problems on this test too. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Well, um. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So it's probably maybe you want to just make a note to add in just to know the differences. Um, the genetic makeup of these but yeah it may it may be it may come in helpful but it may not be like a primary way to answer the question i think the symptomatology behind cool, yeah. it i'll um, just focus on be, that yeah the clinical aspect yeah for stuff. sure just, yeah thank you yeah no worries okay so this kind of breaks it down um here yeah maybe this would be a good slide you could just write the genetic makeup of or the genetic precursors to this and these are the two that have the rings so the urine's red and they're photosensitive. Okay, now let's talk about the liver. Now, when we go, I wanna break it up into three segments. We're gonna go before the liver, in the liver and out uh, and beyond the liver, the liver and beyond. All right, so prehepatic, the bile or the bilirubin is unconjugated. It gets conjugated in the liver. So prehepatic problems typically have to do with uh, lysis of the cells, hemolysis, okay? So the problem is with diseases like, um, well, anything that can cause hemolysis, but like G6PD deficiency. So they, if, you, if you're increasing the turnover of red blood cells, if you're increasing the lysis of red blood cells, you're gonna increase the bilirubin that's just floating around in circulation. So basically you're increasing the unconjugated bilirubin. That's prior to it, gets to the, to it getting to the liver. Now, once you get to the liver, you're intrahepatic, you're worried about the balance, right? You start conjugating it in the liver, okay? So any sort of problems with cirrhosis or intrahepatic, anything that's gonna increase your ALT, AST, um, that's gonna be intrahepatic. Now, posthepatic means that everything got conjugated. We're leaving it. Typically, this has to do with some sort of obstruction, some sort of ductal obstruction, okay? So at that point, everything's conjugated. So when we look at these different problems, we wanna keep it in mind, we're unconjugated before, conjugated in the liver, and there's a balance between that. And then by, by the time it leaves the liver, everything's conjugated, okay? So we'll do it like that. And it kind of says that here, prehepatic and then hepatic or intrahepatic and then posthepatic. And just keep in mind, a lot of the prehepatic problems too, um, hap, that's not a, that's not a spleen, that's a kidney. But the the prehepatic problems uh, have to do with the spleen as well, right? Because the spleen is its job is to kind of break down those red blood cells. So if you want to break down uh, uh, jaundice, you can actually break it down as like splenic jaundice or hemo hemolytic jaundice, and then you can also have some sort of hepatic jaundice as well. Okay, so you can kind of keep those in mind. Uh, as we go ahead. So this kind of breaks these down into three separate sections. And then we're gonna look at the lab values because by all means, these lab values, values are gonna be super important. Okay, again, spleen kind of breaks down the heme, breaks down the red blood cells, you get the heme, and from heme, you get bilirubin. Gotta do something with it, gotta conjugate it, gotta put it in the bile and tend to recycle it. Okay, so let's look at the prehepatic. Again, Synonymous with uh, hemolytic jaundice. So we're looking at the, that here. Now, remember, this is a normal process. Like cells will lyse, cells, the bilirubin will be in floating in circulation. It will be unconjugated prior to getting to the liver. So this is a normal process. There's just more of it. There's accelerated hemolysis, okay? So what we're looking at here is uh, increased unconjugated bilirubin prehepatic, right? So that's because of all that extra hemolysis. Now I want to make a point here. This is albumin bound, okay? So it's not really active. Remember when it's it's in circulation bound to plasma proteins, it keeps it inactive. That's going to come into uh, coming into importance in a little bit. Okay, so again, normal process, there's just more of it. So you would expect uh, you would some of the values that would be that we get to a little later are kind of, you, you wouldn't expect those. All you would expect here is the normal values just increase levels of them. So yeah, you're gonna have an increased total bilirubin because you're breaking down more cells. 
And yeah, you're gonna have an increased unconjugated bilirubin because we haven't got to the liver yet. And yeah, you're supposed to have your bilinogen, right? And you're gonna have increased le levels of it. Okay, normal process, just more of it because of all these, all this hemolysis going on. Now let's get into the liver. So a lot of times we're talking about cirrhosis, whether it be viral or alcohol-based, um, but you can see here the jaundice of the eyes, the yellowing of the skin, um, and the urine turning colors as well, right? So, um, and I, I'm sure you've noticed now, bilirubin has this, this characteristic of making color to everything. It's what colors the bile, what colors the, the urine and the feces too. So if you see any defects there, like pale colored stools, a lot of times that has to do with the bile and the bilirubin. Okay, so keep that in mind. So we're walking, working with intrahepatic problems. So once we get to the liver, we have, um, we have a problem with unconjugated or indirect and direct, which is conjugated. But then only the conjugates found in the urine. Now, why is that? Well, let me point this out. The liver's what's messed up. It's cirrhotic. It's tiny. It's nodular. It's just not working, right? Those hepatocytes are fibrotic and dead. So the unconjugated bilirubin, a lot of it that tries to get there, is kind of it. It doesn't uptake it well, right? It doesn't take it up well because it um, because the liver's diseased. Now, so that's unconjugated bilirubin. It's not really uptaking it as, as it should. But what is taken up is kind of regurgitated back into circulation, right? So all of the the bilirubin that gets to the liver is supposed to be conjugated in this proper way to where you can get stercobilin in the feces and urobilin in the urine, right? But what happens is since the liver's disease, the, 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 the unconjugated bilirubin that does make it there kind of gets regurgitated back, okay? So you get this un increased conjugated bilirubin. That's not supposed to be like that, right? So because of that, you get bilirubin in the urine. Okay, now you may say, well, if there's unconjugated bilirubin floating around that's not getting taken up, why isn't that in the urine too? That's because it's bound to albumin, right? You're not going to get it in the urine as long as it's bound to albumin, all right? So whereas it's supposed to go down this route to properly, right, you should have urobilin in your, in your urine, you should have stercobilin in the feces, but since it's regurgitated back, this conjugated bilirubin leads to loss of actual bilirubin, like un, well conjugated, but not fully processed um, uh, bilirubin in the urine. So that's why it's dark here. So you, you don't want that. That's not supposed to be expected. So when we look at the lab values, yeah, you have increased total bilirubin you have, because you have in, unconjugated because it's not getting to the liver properly. You have increased conjugated because what is getting to the liver is actually getting regurgitated out before it's fully processed. So here, big key point, uh, urine bilirubin, right? Not urine urobilinogen. You would expect this, I would go more low than normal. You would expect this in the urine, not this. This right here, these two boxes, or this, you know, these two columns are telling you that the bilirubin is getting pushed back into circulation. It's getting into the urine before it's fully processed. Now, if you say, okay, I could look at these and I say, it's probably cirrhosis, it's probably a liver problem. What would you expect? Well, likely you have an increased ALT and AST, right? There should be additional lab findings. So use the whole test to your advantage. There should be, hopefully there's two or three things that point you to the correct answer, not just one, right? So use whatever you can. All right, now let's say the liver's okay for the most part, because you can get, well, let's just say the liver's okay, right? And um, the problem, so everything gets conjugated and then uh, you have a stone, all right, a post-hepatic obstructive jaundice, right? And so you have a problem with this conjugated bilirubin because the liver's okay, um, but what's conjugated can't get back through the bile, right? The bile's blocked. Okay, so what's going to happen? So you're not, what would explain for pale colored stool, no stercobilin, right? That's going to be there. You need that fully processed you need it to get into the bile. You need the bile to be processed and then it to get down to the GI tract um, to get stercobilin. So you will get pale colored stools. Now, why is the patient losing weight? Well, you have a blockage of the bile duct, right? And those bile duct, that bile duct um, allows fat soluble vitamins to be absorbed. 
So if you don't have fat soluble vitamins along with um, um, the fat that goes with it, uh, that's gonna be why the patient is losing weight, right? Because you don't have the bile, you don't have the cholesterol, you're not properly absorbing stuff. So let's look at it here. So where's the problem? Okay, everything's fine here. Unconjugated gets to the liver, the liver's fine, right? Now, once we get past the liver, we have a blockage, okay? Um, and the problem here is once it's blocked, the only way to go is backwards, right? So that blocked, um, that blocked duct is going to cause regurgitation as well. But understand it's just conjugated because the liver's okay, it's already processed. Now, this is not supposed to happen, right? It's supposed to be fully processed and go through the, the, the gut. Um, and because of this, you have a decreased, uh, um, decreased proper processing. So you have absent urobilin and decreased stercobilin. And this is gonna lead to the clay colored feces. So again, you have an aberrant or uh, problematic response to this uh, leading to increased conjugated. But key point is it's conjugated here because it's post hepatic. Now, lab values. Yeah, you would expect the increased total bil bilirubin. Being that it's post hepatic, it should be conjugated. Great, it's conjugated. And then we're not going through the proper processes, right? So it's actually, it is actually being blocked and it's regurgitating back through the liver, okay? So the liver is not necessarily diseased, but it, this regurgitation process is because of the backflow from the blockage, okay? So that's just more of an explanation than anything, but you shouldn't see straight up bilirubin in the urine, right? It should be urobilinogen, right? So if this tells you, this should be the one that you key in on, right? Conjugated bilirubin is elevated, unconjugated is normal. Okay, well then I'm expecting a blockage what additional labs would you expect? Well, AOP and GGT, right? That would indicate that you have some sort of um, um, some sort of gallstone, right? Or some sort of blockage in the bile system, right? So use these to your advantage. These should always match up. Now, little kids or babies, infants, um, they have this low hepatic UDP glucuronal transferase, okay? So you can, um, you can put them under UV light. You know, they have jaundice of the uh, newborn or newborn jaundice, and you can uh, get rid of the bilirubin that's building up by putting them under UV light. Now, um, this can lead to kernicterus. This is a problem it, it, that develops as a child. And you can see here, uh, y'all will learn next, next block about uh, the basal ganglia, but you'll see maybe just a buzzword to note here that kernicterus tends to um, under development of the basal ganglia. And this can lead to stuff like spasticity. But I just put this in here more for completeness sake. All right, so let's talk about these inherited um, hyperbilirubinemias, okay? So it's either gonna be unconjugated or conjugated. There are three unconjugated and one conjugated. The convenient part is the three that are unconjugated are just a spectrum of the same thing. Okay, so let's start with the first one. krigler najjar syndrome type one, most severe. You have um, less than 5% of this UDP glucuronal transferase activity. So super severe, right? Less than 5% is working. So, and this, this goes for a lot of different things. Let me just claim right here. Severity is often uh, indicated by age of onset. Okay, so I know, and I, I'm guilty of it too. A lot of times when I do these questions, I skim over the age because sometimes the age isn't important. But you'll see here is a good example of age of onset is really important for the severity. Another example is like the, um, the galactosemias, right? If you're trying to determine, is it, uh, is it a fructose problem? Or is it a galactose problem? Is it a galt or a, let's go with galactose. Is it a galt or a galactokinase problem? Well, you should see a galt deficiency much earlier than a galactokinase deficiency, right? Like GALT should show up in the first two to three weeks, whereas galactokinase may be a, a few years later. So you can use that to your advantage. Same thing with fructose. They don't start eating fruit until six months. So that um, aldolase B deficiency will show up around then, whereas the fructokinase deficiency sometimes isn't seen, if ever, until uh, later in life. So use the age to your benefit, it often indicates severity, and these uh, bilirubinias are a good example of it. 
So yeah, and Galt does have that triad of symptoms, right? Yeah, so it's gonna have cataracts, uh, uh, intellectual um, deficiencies and jaundice, right? Right, okay. So Crigler Najjar type one, unconjugated, it's the most severe, less than 5%. Early onset, okay, you'll see that first. Now type two, look at that 10 to 20%, not as severe, maybe a little later in onset, you know, a few years old. Here we go, this is an important point. Because you have enough enzyme here, this will be able to respond to phenobarbital. You don't need to know the mechanism of action of why this works, but um, because there's enough enzyme here, it can, uh, it can work with phenobarbital or phenobarbital can work with type two because it's less severe. You wouldn't see phenobarbital used in type one because you just don't have enough enzyme. Okay, so just in case they ask that. And Gilbert, I used to call him Gilbert, but apparently I was told he's not sophisticated. He's just Gilbert. Okay, right. so Gilbert doesn't, look, you got about 50%, okay? So um, maybe this doesn't show up to your 20s, your teens or 20s, okay? So I put this here. These three are increased unconjugated bilirubin. Age is a good clue here. Type one is worse than type two is worse than type or, or Gilbert syndrome, okay? Another important point, because we're talking about the, these problems with bilirubin in the liver, if they start bringing up jaundice and stuff, check the liver enzymes, because in these genetic problems, these liver enzymes are normal, right? So you're like, you got this, all this unconjugated bilirubin, or, uh, you, and you're like, well, what's the liver enzymes looking like? These are normal for these diseases. So that'll, that'll, that'll push you from some sort of, you know, prehepatic, intrahepatic problem to these genetic problems, the liver values. Now, the other one is Dubin Johnson. So I think they also call this like black liver, so or dark liver, black liver, something like that um, syndrome. And so well, you have increased conjugated or direct bilirubin here. So the bilirubin is able to get into the liver it's able to get conjugated, but because of this ABC transporter, um, you have a problem with conjugated bilirubin, okay? So that would be the difference here. But again, liver enzymes are normal. So that's a good clue here for these. All right, so since we've been talking about the liver function tests, we can kind of go into these. This is from first aid if you wanna get into it uh, a little more detail, but um, we're gonna go through it in, uh, from what the lectures had. So as you would expect, some sort of liver problem, you're gonna have jaundice, some right upper quadrant pain, cirrhosis is a sign of chronic, uh, chronic liver uh, insult. And then even more severely, you can get encephalopathy. Remember again, that has a lot to do with the ammonia that builds up. Ammonia is gonna end up binding to glutamate, to glutamine, it's gonna build up in the brain, you can get cerebral edema. Ascites has to do with the albumin, right? If the liver's not making albumin, that oncotic pressure in the vessels isn't there because that albumin is, is in the vessels. So all of the fluid ends up in the extracellular space. So you get this big, this big swelling, right? This fluid buildup, extracellular fluid. And you can get other things like esophageal varices. This is due to that portal hypertension and then coagulation disorders. You're not making those coagulation factors, right? Okay. So again, this points out that if you have some sort of um, inherited hyperbilirubinemia, normal enzyme. So that's kind of like that first branch point. Are the liver enzymes normal or not? Is it inherited or is it some sort of acquired insult? All right. Now, as you know by now, ALT and AST are super important when we talk about this uh, with the liver. You'll see increase ALT versus AST. Typically, it's some sort of viral hepatitis or viral problem. As you know, a shot of tequila higher than ALT, it's usually a two to one ratio. This would indicate longstanding chronic uh, alcoholic, uh, alcoholic cirrhosis. So you're gonna to wanna to remember these. These are always gonna come back, but just remember which goes with which. Now we pointed out earlier with some of those hepatic conjugated bilirubin problems, um, if we have some sort of blockage, this cholestasis, uh, you're gonna have increased GGT and ALP. An important point here is that um, the don't let the lab values 
throw you off. This should be like, if you have a blockage, it should be really elevated, like not just mildly elevated. So if you have a really elevated AST and ALT and you have just a slightly elevated ALP and GGT, think more of the liver. Like if you have this post hepatic blockage, these values are gonna skyrocket, right? Multiple folds, 10 folds higher, right? So um, don't let like small little, little changes uh, affect you because there's a little variance there. So these values should be, um, should be really elevated in some sort of uh, cholestat cholestatic blockage. Uh, okay, and you should see them together. ALP independently could be some sort of bone problem, could be some sort of growth or pregnancy. Um, and uh, GGT, usually uh, it could be isolated in some sort of alcoholic problem, but usually you're gonna see, at least for this test, they're gonna be elevated together because it's some sort of blockage, okay? Um, again, we mentioned this, oh, the albumin, right? So remember that's that oncotic pressure, that pressure that holds fluid in the vessels. So if you don't have this large protein in the vessels, all the fluid's gonna wanna leak out the vessels. And so you get ascites here. And if you remember this, the serum protein, this is that first albumin peak. So you see a decreased level, you get this beta gamma bridge here. I don't know, that's not really important. The point is that you're making significantly less uh, albumin because of the uh, liver problem. And then of course, clotting factors are gonna come into play. You could check your uh, prothrombin time or your PT, um, uh, uh, PTT and um, but if, you're not, if your liver's not working properly, you're gonna have a clotting, clotting, pro, clotting factor deficiency, okay? And then we've mentioned ammonia. If ammonia is building up because the liver can't process it properly, you can get a lot of neurologic problems. Okay, and I just wanted to put this in for completeness sake since we kind of talked about everything else. Some sort of pancreatic deficiency, serious of blockage right about you know, in the, in, the, in the pancreatic duct or like right around the ampulla vader, um, you can get increased amylase and lipase too, right? So that would indicate blockage. So use these lab values um, to help diagnose, but, um, but specifically to help tell you where on the biliary tree uh, the, the stone may be lodged, okay? If it's isolated to an ALP GGT, it might be in the cystic duct. If it includes the ALP, GGT, AST, and ALT, right? So it's just, it's the, the gallbladder and the liver, it's probably in the common bile duct. If it includes those and these right here, this pancreatic problem, it's probably somewhere toward the exit where everything comes together, okay? So, all right. So we could talk about alcohol and xenobiotics are just medications that you take, they're not naturally occurring. So um, remember, um, if you remember this one, we talked about, uh, talked about ultra, uh, ultra, ultra rapid metabolizers and slow metabolizers. Um, these are those P450 enzymes that have to do with uh, uh, metabolizing drugs, right? So phase one is going to basically most of the time activate the drug. Sometimes it'll inactivate it, but most of the time it'll activate it, that, um, that first pass metabolism. The phase two will basically inactivate it, second pass and then it'll make it polar so it could be um, excreted in the urine. What you need to know uh, right now, so CYP3A4 is one of those P450 enzymes. It is the most important one. It does most of the work. But the one we wanna talk about specifically is the 2E1, CYP2E1. It's gonna deal with uh, both alcohol and acetaminophen, Tylenol, right? So we're gonna look at that. So um, just briefly, I don't know that they'll test gel on this, but remember there are inducers and inhibitors. Uh, we're actually just looking at this again in term four. So these inducers will help to metabolize the drugs faster and inhibitors such as grapefruit juice, when you, know, when you drink alcohol and have some ting on the island, y'all don't know about that, but um, it'll inhibit it and, and the alcohol will stay in your system longer, get a nice buzz. So yeah, there's a difference here, but um, I don't think that's high yield for you right now. Okay, so typically this CYP2E1, if you take normal doses of acetaminophen, um, if you take normal doses, most of it's either gonna get glucuronated, glucuronated and, or sulfated, but about 5% actually gets broken down into this NAPQI, okay? So with toxic doses, 
you can actually get um, that 5% kind of comes into play, right? This NAPQI is very toxic, okay? So, um, right, and so if you increased your, yeah, also secondarily, um, alcohol will also increase. So it's an inducer of this CYP2E1. So it'll help metabolize things faster. So, but what I wanted to point out here is, excuse me, take note in acetylcysteine, um, is, uh, is the antidote for uh, uh, Tylenol overdose in acetylcysteine, just in case they ask. Okay, so that's basically Tylenol, that NA, 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 NAPQI um, is gonna be what you're worried about there. 2E1 is gonna be the P450 you're worried about, so they could ask you something um, along those lines. Now. Let's talk about ethanol. Now there's a process. The first step is to make ethanol to acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is toxic. The enzyme that does that is alcohol dehydrogenase. Now, ideally, um, uh, the, you're gonna use uh, the mitochondrial acetaldehyde DH2 in the mitochondria to make acetate. So, but at very high doses, you use this other pathway, this cytosolic or this DH1. Take note of these, right? So uh, the DH2 is the normal one. High doses, you're gonna get this DH1 and you're gonna get acetate. Acetate's more of the form that gets you the buzz. Acetaldehyde is the toxic form. So what ethanol, alcohol dehydrogenase makes acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase makes acetate. Okay, so when we talk about this process, this cytosolic, this DH1 process, uh, this is this uh, microsomal ethanol oxidizing system. Don't get microsomal mixed up with mitochondrial. Mitochondrial is the normal one. Microsomal is the cytosolic one with the high doses. All right, so you're going to see this in the hepatocytes. And um, these contain both 2E1 and 3A4, but what we're concerned about is this 2E, 2E1. We have a lot of acetaldehyde. Remember that uh, ethanol is one of those um, zero order, um, it's metabolized in a zero order kinetics. So it's not a percentage base, it's, it's by quantity. So the more you drink, uh, it kind of backs up in your system, which is why um, you can uh, not overdose, but get intoxicated quickly, right? You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, so that's why we're worried about this, this rollover to the, to the cytosolic form, this MEOS system in the, in the 2E1 uh, in the cytosol. So remember that the mitochondrial is under normal circumstances, gonna do the DH2 uh, high affinity, right? Good, so that's what you want. But in these extra, in these, in these higher doses, these uh, binging patterns, this cytosolic as, as aldehyde DH1 uh, is going to come into play, right? So then the acetaldehyde is going to have a more predominance of accumulating, which is toxic. Okay, now another point, this kind of goes back, but remember when when you drink on an empty stomach, why do you get uh, accelerated uh, uh, um, fasting hypoglycemia, right? Why is that? Because the alcohol you that you're drinking um, actually causes an increased NADH to NAD ratio. The alcohol will cause this, and this by itself will uh, inhibit gluconeogenesis. So you drink on an empty stomach, get a buzz faster, but then you can't make more glucose because you have this ratio. Remember uh, that this also is what ends up causing ketosis, right? This increased NADH ratio to NAD ratio is what shunts everything to ketosis. So that's independent. So let me say that again. Excess alcohol will cause this increase NADH to NAD ratio. That's gonna reduce gluconeogenesis. You can get severe fast hypoglycemia. Also, when you're in a state of starvation, you end up getting this increase NADH to NAD ratio. And with that, you're shunting the system toward ketone body formation, okay? Um, really important to know this. They actually don't use it too much anymore just because uh, people aren't really compliant with it. And um, even if they are and they take it, it's just really toxic for the liver. Um, but the idea is if you're compliant with the medication, this will in inhibit aldehyde dehydrogenase. That way, when you drink alcohol, 
um, you'll block it, at, you'll block the aldehyde dehydrogenase, the disulfiram will, and uh, you get a buildup of acid aldehyde. So you don't get a buzz, you get like immediate hangover sy uh, symptoms. Um, so this is kind of um, a deterrent to drinking alcohol anyway, because you can't uh, form the acetate. So remember that disulfiram. Okay, two stars on this slide. You need to basically know the whole slide, right? So back in the day, people used to go into the hospital and say they had methanol poisoning and they got, a, they got a, some free alcohol, right? Because alcohol works as a competitive inhibitor. Now they actually use fomipazil, so it doesn't work like that. But you could uh, say you had methanol poison, get a free meal at the hospital and some booze, but not anymore. So the point is it's a competitive inhibitor. So, um, when, so basically let's start here. So ethanol is gonna make alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, aldehyde is gonna be, to the acid aldehyde is gonna be toxic. You need to make it to acetate, which is the non-toxic form. If you ingest methanol, methanol, uh, a lot of the problems they talk about here, <clears throat> if you're familiar with moonshine, back in prohibition, they used to, it used to be uh, alcohol was outlawed. So they used to make moonshine in the woods. It was really strong. And um, sometimes the, the methanol would overwhelm the, the, you would have too high levels of methanol. So it could cause blindness, right? So the, the alcohol was so strong, it would end up causing blindness because they were making alcohol in the woods, right? But so if you get methanol poisoning, the toxic substance is formaldehyde. Now, let's say that was the case, right? What you do is you can actually give them ethanol or fomipazil. Remember as a competitive inhibitor, you have to overwhelm the enzyme, right? You have to give more alcohol or more ethanol or more fomipazil because you want to kind of hog the, or, or deter or, or pull the enzyme away from metabolizing methanol to start metabolizing ethanol, right? So that's the idea. It's a competitive inhibitor. You need more of it. You need to overwhelm the KM, right? So that's the idea of a competitive inhibitor. And then ethylene glycol, that's antifreeze. Uh, the question they could put on a test is the child went into the garage and he drank something sweet. It tends to be sweet or uh, yeah, it happens with animals too, but ethylene glycol gets converted to glycoaldehyde, which is type toxic and it needs to be formed with glycolic acid. But if you wanna take anything away from this, you wanna know that ethanol and fomipazil are competitive inhibitors. So if you have some sort of intoxication, the idea is you give them this, you can uh, deter or uh, divert, that's the word I'm looking for. You can divert the enzyme that makes these toxic intermediates from these to use these, uh, to break down these, which are more, uh, uh, um, which are uh, more readily uh, dealt with in the body. Okay, so again, methanol, um, there you go, there's some moonshine. Um, and so you could see, uh, yeah, toxic doses. Again, uh, this is just a little bit more uh, elaboration on it, but I think I kind of covered the point. Ethylene glycol is toxic as antifreeze. Remember the idea is fomipazil or ethanol is a competitive inhibitor. So pull and use all the enzyme you can. They tend to be, uh, ethanol is has a higher affinity for the enzyme um, than uh, ethylene glycol or methanol. So you can actually pull it away and break down the ethanol and use up all the enzyme. So the ethylene glycol isn't metabolized so quickly. Okay, also take note, this is gonna cause metabolic acidosis. As was mentioned, y'all may have some throwback questions. Um, and if y'all want to look at those later, yeah, and that's not a problem. You might have some throwback questions that ask about metabolic acidosis. They may incorporate some of these new concepts in with the old uh, mathematics with the, the carbon dioxide and whatnot and the bicarb. So this is going to cause uh, a metabolic acidosis, anion gap metabolic acidosis, as metabolic acidosis at that. Okay. Um, we could take a few minute break and uh, we'll come back and knock out the vitamins and lysosomal storage diseases. And Lindsay Kid's gonna go over some stuff with you guys too. So I had a quick question. A few you. minutes, yep. Do you have any good like um, resources for like the histo stuff or recommend like how to incorporate that? Um, I just all, well, like, I- 
because I know this test is probably what a lot of biochem and um, yeah, anatomy, it's a but... it's a balance between stuff. You're definitely going to have some histo on there. Um, I would do the histo questions in the book, but if you don't have time, they tend to use the same question. I mean, it's the same images from lecture. So I would I would just try to get through look through those images again um, to try to try to see. I think some of the things that Lindsay and I pointed out last time. Make sure you can know the difference between uh, Bruner's glands in the duodenum and the uh, um, and the large intestine with the goblet cells because those kind of look the same. Uh, make sure you can know the difference between the lymphatic tissue in the appendix versus the payer's patches and make sure you can tell the difference between the rugae in the stomach and the uh, the villi in the um, or the, the the foldings in the um, in the small intestine. Those were some that we had that were kind of trippy, but other than that, um, I, I mean, I would just try to look at the, the pictures in in the lecture. Yeah. Make sure you don't underestimate the stomach slides for the cells, the parietal cells, the chief cells and all of that stuff. They're not going to ask you to identify with us. It was pretty high order, like third order, fourth order. Um, it points to a cell, you have the vignette, but then you have to know what the cell makes and everything incorporated with that. I feel like that was um, a big, big thing. So make sure that you do understand the biochemistry behind all of those cells and you can identify them because if you can identify them and pick out the biochemistry, you're good. Phoebe's snoring, if y'all hear her, sorry about that. She does not like DM more than you guys, I promise. And we'll stay after. Yeah, we should have played the trot song. <laughs> we'll stay after and answer any like cumulative questions y'all want to look at after. If y'all want to phosphorylate your, your phosphorylate your phosphorylase with us, by all means. All right. <laughs> all right. So vitamins now. We'll go through these kind of quickly, but you want to kind of just have a working definition for them um, to kind of understand what each of them what each of them do, and the clinical deficiencies that can occur. These this is from first aid. It kind of gives you a general breakdown of it. So let's talk about the fat soluble vitamins first. When I think about vitamin A, I typically think about the eyes, right? So night blindness. Uh, vision, this 11 cis retinol is a component in vision, has to do with the rods. You know, you'll learn about the rods and cones. Uh, Rhodopsin is for rods. Uh, so night vision, right? Black and white vision. Um, and it's also a antioxidant. So the three antioxidants are ACE, A, C, and E, right? Vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin E are all antioxidants, okay? So when you think of vitamin A, think of eyes, night vision, problems there. Okay, again, night blindness. This billet spots, that little, the little white spots that, that form in the eye, I like to talk about that. So that's a good buzzword. But again, we're typically correlating um, things that have to do with the eye. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, again, lipid soluble antioxidant along with vitamin E. So fat soluble vitamins. So when you think of fat soluble vitamins, you need to think, um, uh, in the bell as well, right? So problems, any sort of obstruction, you're gonna have a problem absorbing these fat soluble vitamins, okay? Um, yeah, and there you go, the antioxidants. And then you can get, I don't know if the test about this hypervitaminosis, you have to take so much of, of the vitamin, like, you know, even though America has the most expensive urine in the world, we all take vitamins and we pee it all out, but you have to take a whole lot to really get an effect that would cause this. Uh, intracranial hypertension. But just in case they asked, I wanted to put it in. Remember, um, it can be a teratogen if you're using it for um, uh, primarily for acne prevention, right? So it can be a teratogen. Um, so you need to know that, right? Okay, vitamin D. You definitely know everything about vitamin D already. Uh, you know kind of the pathway of how it breaks down. In the liver, it's converted to cholecalciferol to 25-hydroxychole calciferol, 
right? 25 hydroxylase. The question they like to ask is in the kidney, if you have chronic renal failure, what, you know, what's going on? Well, you don't have one alpha hydroxylase. So you can't convert the 25 to 125 uh, dihydroxycholecalciferol, which is the activated form. So remember this, vitamin D has a lot to do with absorption in the gut. It makes uh, calbindin. Um, it's, it, it works like a, a lipophilic, um, um, uh, like a hormone, right? So it goes to vitamin D, goes to the nucleus and actually affects gene transcription of calbindin. Calbindin goes to the lumen in the gut and it helps to bring in all the calcium, right? And this works along with uh, PTH. So it's a lot about vitamin D. Again, if you have a deficiency in vitamin D as a kid, it's rickets. Typically you get the bow leg formation, maybe a pigeon chest deformity. In adults, it's osteomalacia, same thing, but in adults. You can also get hypervitaminos hypervitaminosis D. Uh, you get these, uh, these ectopic soft tissue mineralizations, right? So like just, uh, just calcium deposits in soft tissues, which I guess kind of makes sense. If you have too much vitamin D, too much calcium, you can get these deposits. Vitamin K, remember, has to do with clotting. These 2, 7, 9, and 10, however you remember it, 1972, whatever works for you. It has to do with this gamma glutamyl carboxylase or this gamma carboxylation, right? So it has to do with clotting. So if you have a problem with, uh, with vitamin K, uh, you can get excess bleeding. Um, good point to make, vitamin K is made by your gut flora right? So um, neonates, when they're born, have to get a injection uh, with vitamin K just so that it allows them time for their gut floor to make, uh, to build up so it can help to process the vitamin K. Um, and so this, by giving them an injection at birth, uh, they're not going to have any sort of bleeding problems um, in the meantime. All right. Warfarin, super important. It's um, um, it's a blood thinner, right? It inhibits this vitamin K epoxide reductase. Uh, so that's an important point you want to make sure you know. Um, neonates, again, hemorrhagic disease of the new newborn takes time for the gut flora to develop. So you give them vitamin K injections. Right, so this would make sense, right? This, this bleeding, this, uh, this formation, this ecchymosis, um, this hematuria, um, excess bleeding, black tarry stools. So melanin, th this is indicative of some sort of upper GI bleed, right? The reason it turns black is because uh, the blood uh, is kind of processed as it goes through the GI tract. You can also get, if you see uh, bright red blood, that, that, that tends to be uh, hemorrhoids or something towards the end of the GI tract. And then hematuria is blood in the urine. So yeah, so this is all, something uh, have to do with vitamin K and prothrombin time, right? That's something you can measure. Typically you're measuring uh, factor seven here. Vitamin E, it is an antioxidant along with vitamin A and vitamin C. Uh, again, lipid soluble, that's what you wanna know about it. Okay, let's go into the water soluble vitamin. So basically C and all the Bs, right? So vitamin C, you know, scurvy, you know, uh, the pirate used to get it because they didn't have fruits on the boats. Um, it deals with uh, collagen formation, proleal and lysyl hydroxylase, um, also helps with absorption of iron. So problems with that, you can end up with microcytic or small, uh, small red blood cells. And again, it's an antioxidant, okay? Um, yeah. Okay, and problems with collagen formation, uh, you could end up with bleeding. So similar to vitamin K deficiency in its presentation, but very different uh, in its molecular mechanisms. Now let's go through the, the B vitamins. B1 is thiamine, right? Remember, very importantly, star on this slide, we have those three enzymes that use all of the TLC for Nancy. Remember, thiamine, lipoic acid, CoA, FAD, and NAD, right? So pyruvate dehydrogenase uses it, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, and this branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase, okay? Um, they all use them, all dehydrogenases, so they all need B1. 
Um, so definitely know these for the test. You'll get a couple of questions, right? Also, and I would always forget this one, there was also another step that needs uh, B1. It doesn't use all five of them, but it does need B1 um, and it's transketolase, okay, for the PPP shunt or HMP shunt. And remember, um, if we go back, this branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase problem there leads to uh, maple syrup urine disease. Teal for Nancy is the mnemonic for the five, um, for the five enzymes, I'm sorry, the five cofactors that are needed for these complexes. So there are five cofactors that are needed for pyruvate dehydrogenase, for alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, and for branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase. You need five cofactors. T is for thiamine, L is for lipoic acid, C is for CoA, F is for FAD, and N is for NAD. So this is just a mnemonic to remember the five cofactors needed for these three enzyme complexes. Again, yeah. So remember uh, this branch chain uh, um, needs TPP. So a problem with this enzyme can lead to maple syrup urine disease, but just remember that TPP is one of the enzymes, I'm sorry, one of the cofactors, thymine, it's one of the cofactors needed for this process. So what if you have a deficiency? So there's a couple of things. We talk about this berry-berry problem. So there's two types. There's wet and dry. Dry tends to be stuff with the nerves, polyneuropathies, okay? So you get dry, where berry-berry. Uh, cardiac, or if you remember, the heart pumps blood, blood's wet. You get wet berry-berry with the heart, okay? So these are problems. Note that this uh, low transketolase buzzword there, that it's a uh, thiamine problem, okay? So you could check thiamine levels, but this beriberi can come up. So you want to know this. You can see, look at this pedal edema. So it's, um, um, yeah, you can see the fluid build up there. Okay, another problem, and y'all will get into this a little bit uh, next uh, block, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, but this is very common with the thiamine deficiency. Typically, alcoholics don't uh, have, uh, they don't uh, eat properly. They, uh, they have this vitamin deficiency of thiamine. So Wernicke has a lot to do with ophthalmoplegia. Their eyes are kind of, you know, you got a, a googly eye. It's kind of like, not, you know, it, it, you get blurry vision. And the stagmus um, tends to be the, the, uh, the, the snapping of the eye. Uh, ataxia confusion. And then the Korsakoff problem has to do with confabulations. So this is really extreme thiamine deficiency uh, that you see that's related specifically to alcohol abuse. Probably low yield right now, but it's going to get super important next. Okay. Vitamin B2 is riboflavin, has to do with FAD primarily. So, um, and you see it here in these, some of these reactions. Um, but what you want to remember about uh, riboflavin is you get glossitis, you can see that here, the tongue swelling and redness and chelosis. That's what you see here over here. So buzzwords for riboflavin is chelosis and glossitis. B3, niacin, important, NAD. Um, so what you see here with this problem is pellagra. They talk about this a lot, the three Ds of pellagra, dermatitis, diarrhea, and dementia even death, right? So this has to do with a niacin deficiency. So make sure you know pellagra has to do with niacin, the three Ds of pellagra. Okay, and then remember, we talked about this, this is kind of a throwback, precursor to NAD is tryptophan, right? So if you have a, some sort of tryptophan deficiency or uh, problems in transport like heart and up disease, um, you could end up with pellagra. So heart and up disease is this transporter defect. And with this, you end up with pellagra. So you get the diarrhea, dementia, dermatitis. Then um, the opposite would be some sort of excess uh, tryptophan. Tryptophan leads to serotonin. You can get some sort of serotonin syndrome with flushing and uh, tachycardia and stuff like that. Right, and then B6 is a little funky. Um, it's like a little all over the place, but remember B6, that PLP is used in a lot of different, uh, different reactions, right? So um, what you'll see in some of these, you can actually end up with microcytic anemia. This is that pathway uh, with that heme synthesis, this delta uh, aminolevulinic acid. You also get problems with homocysteine. If you can't break down homocysteine, you have cardiovascular problems. This one's a little weird. It's kind of all over the place, but uh, we wanted to include it. And these are kind of the problems you'll see. 
with B6 problems. So these are the things, just little definitions for each that'll help you. Remember, we talked about isoniazid, tuberculosis treatment. Um, it mops up all the B6. So if you have a problem uh, with B6, um, or if you're taking isoniazid, you need to take uh, additional B6 supplementation. Biotin, remember all carboxylation reactions um, use biotin, but as for deficiencies or uh, other than that, I don't think it's super highly tested. It has to do with raw egg whites. I don't know if they'll ask you that. We talked about folic acid. Uh, folic acid uh, has a lot to do with neural tube defects. Remember you break down homocysteine uh, problems there. Uh, and again, along with B12, it can cause megaloblastic anemia, right? Also hypersegmented neutrophils. You see that with the megaloblastic anemia. Deficiency, you want to think neural tube defects, megaloblastic anemia, right? Now, to also with megaloblastic anemia, you have a B12 problem can cause that. The difference between the folic acid and the B12, uh, with B12, you're going to see neurologic defects, right? You're going to have this uh, increased methylmalinate in the urine. Okay, so two important steps. And I remember uh, Dr. Sobern pointing this out and wanting us to really key in on it. Two important steps that use B12 as a cofactor when you're converting homocysteine to methionine, methionine synthase, and this methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. So this is this odd chain fatty acid breakdown. But again, in the urine, you're gonna have, uh, this is, uh, it's not exactly synonymous, but um, it's pretty, it's used interchangeably for methylmalinate, right? So you'll have uh, methylmalinate in the urine. So that'll be indicative of B12. So again, folate versus B12, both have megaloblastic anemia, both have hypersegmented neutrophils, but with B12, you're gonna have neurologic defects and you're also going to have uh, methylmalinate in the urine. Fig glue would be something you would look for in the urine as that precursor um, in the folate problem. Now we'll talk again. Remember that parietal cells have intrinsic factor. They bind the B12, bring it to the terminal ileum, and uh, that's where B12 is absorbed, right? Pernicious anemia, some sort of autoantibody attack on those parietal cells. You won't get intrinsic factor. Um, if you have some sort of terminal ileal resection for whatever reason, um, you could have a problem absorption there. Uh, and we kind of talked about this again, and they may mention this folate trap problem. What ends up happening is when you're transferring this methyl group around, um, if you don't have B12, folate gets caught as a uh, uh, methyl tetrahydrofolate, right? At, at this folate, and um, that's this could actually uh, kind of um, sequester all of the folate. And so you end up with a folate deficiency as well because you can't properly transfer the uh, the methyl group. It gets stuck there because you don't have the B12 to help keep moving. So it gets stuck as methyl tetrahydrofolate. So you don't, don't get confused. That could be a secondary folate deficiency. It's a little more out there, but just to see this where this folate trap, that's what they're talking about. Okay, and again, we see here this megaloblastic anemia. There's no central pallor there. They're swollen cells. These are our hypersegmented neutrophils. All right, so let's quickly, let's go through them again. All right, so fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. A, we're thinking of uh, vision problems. It's an antioxidant, right? D, we're worried about calcium, particularly absorption problems, is rickets, osteomalacia. A, D, E is an antioxidant, right? Um, and K is used as a clotting factor. Remember, warfarin will inhibit it. And um, it's used on 2, 7, 9, and 10 in the clotting cascade. Okay, so let's go to the water-soluble ones. Vitamin C, collagen synthesis, you see problems with scurvy. It's used with lysine and proleal hydroxylase with that collagen formation. C is also an antioxidant. B1 is thiamine. You see thiamine deficiencies you can get. Um, it's used in all of those reactions, uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase, alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, and branched-chain keto acid. All of those used all five of the cofactors. Um, thiamine, lipoic acid, CoA, NAD, and FAD, okay? Now, B1 is also used in transketolase reactions too, okay? B1 deficiency can lead to 
beriberi. Dry beriberi has to do with polyneuropathies, neurologic problems. Wet beriberi has to do with the heart. You can also see thiamine deficiencies in chronic alcoholics as a nutritional deficiency. That's caused work called Wookie Korsakoff. Um, it has to do with ataxia, confusion, um, and can lead to confabulations. Okay, B2 is uh, riboflavin, um, so FAD. Uh, and, and you can see problems with that are chelosis and glossitis. Vitamin uh, B3 is niacin. So problems there, you get pellagra, dermatitis, dementia, diarrhea, okay? Um, uh, tryptophan is the precursor to niacin. So stuff like heart and up disease can lead to a niacin deficiency. Uh, B5, we don't really talk about. B6 or PLP, uh, remember it has a bunch of different steps that it's the cofactor for. It could lead to cardiovascular problems if you can't break down homocysteine, microcytic anemia with that, the heme synthesis. Um, and remember, isoniazid is a tuberculosis treatment that could mop up all of the B6. B7 is biotin. It's used in carboxylation reactions. Other than that, it's you can get a deficiency with too much white, uh, the white, uh, the egg whites. Uh, B9 is folate. Uh, think of neural tube defects. And uh, so you have megaloblastic anemia, as you can see here in B9 and hypersegmented neutrophils. B12 can also cause this, uh, um, this macrocytic um, megaloblastic anemia and hypersegmented neutrophils. To differentiate B B9, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, B9 folate, which will have maybe figlu in the urine with B12. B12 will have methyl malinate in the urine and you will see neurologic defects. So if you could kind of summarize all that like that, you should be good to go for the exam. It's kind of just a general um, overview of the um, of the vitamins. Okay, so this this lecture was uh, a lot of review. So I didn't want to. Uh, I don't think anybody really wanted to talk about glycolysis again. Um, but if y'all have questions at the end regarding this, by all means, we'll answer these. But um, this was more of review. Um, uh, I I could bring up a um, one point. So you want to be able to differentiate. Uh, type one diabetics with type two diabetics, not just by their presentation, like what they look like. Like principally you'll see type one diabetics, they're diagnosed younger, they tend to be skinny. Type two diabetics to diagnose or, uh, later, it's a more of an acquired defect. Uh, they have the insulin resistance versus type one, they don't make insulin. But you also wanna be able to diagnose them with their lab values, right? So like if a d d uh, type one diabetics is in DKA, a diabetic ketoacidosis, um, you can check the ketone levels in the urine. So if you a patient comes in and they don't give you, they don't define the patient by what they look like. And they just tell you their, their sugars are 600. And you're like, are they type one or type two? Well, check the ketones, okay? Because the, the type one diabetic is gonna be making ketones. So that's a good way of doing it. Okay, let's go into the lysosomal sores diseases. Some of these are really similar, um, but you wanna to try to pick out the defining characteristics that separate them. And Dr. Mage put a mnemonic chart, which I added here at the end. That'll be your best friend um, in remembering these. I really like that. This is from first aid. You could see some of the pictures that differentiate them. Gaucher's disease has this crumpled tissue paper and then um, Neiman Picks has this, um, I forget what they call it, uh, lipid laden, or yeah, we'll, we'll get to it in a second. Um, um, yeah, foam cells, yeah, they're real foamy. All right, cool, thank you. All right, Hurley, Hurler syndrome. So Hurlers and Hunters are very similar in that they deal with accumulation of dermatin sulfate or heparin sulfate. How do you differentiate the two? Well, one, it's, it's uh, L-iuronidase or alpha-L alpha -L or something like that, L-iuronidase for Hurler syndrome. Now, what you see in both of them, like I said, dermatin and heparin sulfate are gonna be elevated. Um, but with Hurler syndrome, you get this corneal clouding. The way I like to remember it is hunters to be able to hunt, they, uh, there you go, exactly, right? Hunters to be able to hunt, uh, they, they can't have corneal clouding. So hurlers have corneal clouding and some of these other features, hepatosplenomegaly, 
stuff like that. So hunters, same sort of process. Um, it's probably good to know the genetic uh, derivatives there. I didn't, I didn't point these out, but uh, in, in this, but I, I would take note of those. Um, but you're not going to see corneal clouding here in Hunter syndrome. Okay, Tay Sachs, super common, really sad. These these children die pretty young. The way the mnemonic is, if it has a hyphen, so Tay Sachs or Neiman Picks, they both have the uh, cherry red spot, spot in the macula. Okay, um, but here you're gonna you're gonna want to know these beta hexoamidase A um, is going to be the deficient enzyme. You're going to get an accumulation of ganglioside. Okay, and it's going to cause this neurodegeneration. Right. So here's your process. I wouldn't bother drawing all this out. I would know the keywords. Okay, developmental milestones die by two to six, unfortunately. Tay-Sachs disease really important. Cherry red spot. Also take note. You might not think of this uh, immediately, but you do not get hepatosplenomegaly here. That's gonna differentiate it, another differentiating factor from Neiman picks. In Neiman picks, you get hepatosplenomegaly. So no hepatosplenomegaly here. Also know this, for some reason, I remember this on the test. Either it was a picture, I think it was a picture, or they talked about this onion shell inclusion thing. So that's Tay-Sachs. Gaucher's disease, this was definitely on the test as well. Here with the deficient enzyme is beta-glucosidase. Right, and um, what they actually brought out, and one of the distinguishing factors here is this bone, this bone problem. So they talk about this flash shape. You can see this is like remnant bone right here. It's not really calcified very well. You see this little wedge part. So you get this Erlenmeyer flask shape. So they talked about that on the test, and that that bone is uh, that bone problem is specific to Gaucher. Uh, and um, crumpled crumpled tissue paper. Okay, so that's one of the things uh, pathologically that you can see there. Fabry's disease, I'm sure Dr. Mage told you the story about the kid who had it that was like farting in church or something. Um, that's how I remember it. They said like globicide, globicide farts or something. She said that in class and me and my friends just never forgot it. So if you remember that, uh, you get this accumulation of globicide. So it's galactosidase is the enzyme. Right, so that's how we remembered globicide farts or something. Um, but again, you're not gonna get hepatosplenomegaly there with fibrase disease. So neither Tay-Sachs nor fibrase has hepatosplenomegaly. Neiman picks, it's got a hyphen. So remember, it's got the cherry red spots. What differentiates it from Tay-Sachs in Neiman picks, you're gonna see hepatosplenomegaly, okay? So know your enzymes. Those are second and third order questions they can ask. And he, see here, look how large, uh, the baby's stomach is, look at that liver outline right there and the spleen outline right there. It's very large, hepatosplenomegaly. And here with Neiman picks, they could throw out the, the foamy cells or foam cells. Okay, this one's not super highly tested. I, I imagine it's very um, low yield and not very common, but I put it in here for completeness sake. Uh, Pompe's disease is kind of a crossover. It does it is in the lysosomes, even though it's considered a glycogen storage disease. But remember, pompe sounds like pump. So we're worried about the heart primarily. Eye cells disease is another one of those. Remember, eye cells disease, one of those things, the mano 6 phosphate, it kind of tags it for destruction. So you just kind of put the mano 6 phosphate on there, lets the, the cell know that it needs to destroy that, put it in the lysosome. So if you can't mark it for destruction, you get these eye cells or inclusion bodies. So make sure you know this. So presentation similar to hurlers, but you get these inclusion bodies. So if you can't mark the 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 you know the endosome or whatever you're trying to destroy for the lysosomes, you can end up uh, with these inclusion bodies. So that's what the eye and eye cell disease is for. And then two stars on this one, knock these out, and um, you should be good on the exam. All right, and uh, I, I really like these clinical cases. Make sure you go through those. Um, I felt like the questions were really relevant and straightforward. Um, because of that, I didn't add questions for this either. But if y'all have any specific questions regarding those, um, somebody did mention, yeah, the, I would go back and make sure you know how to, how to determine the metabolic versus respiratory alkalosis and acidosis. By all means, be able to do that. And if you see any sort of, uh, typically they're gonna be metabolic problems here, right? We talk, um, with these, with these uh, GI problems. Um, so be able to 
uh, calculate those, figure out the, um, the response mechanism, um, and you should be good to go. So, um, Lindsay, do you want to go ahead and then we'll, we'll uh, get all the questions after? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, I'll let you share your screen. Smoke has been um, trying to attack me this whole time, so he's probably going to distract me. I'm just going <laughs> to um, warn you guys on that. Okay. Okay. Minerals and nutritional anemias. Nope. Oh. So this is at the very end of your lecture slides for this. This is gold right here. I would memorize absolutely everything on here. No joke. Um, the only thing about these vitamins and minerals that you need to add to this chart, make sure you know what B number they are because they can use any name for any of these vitamins. So make sure that you do assign them. But um, look at all of the enzymes, look at all of the deficiencies because this is gold and it's extremely high yield. Um, for the enzymes, please know every single enzyme that is associated with all of these. It's very important. Okay, so the first one, the minerals copper um, enzymes, lysyl oxidase, which is associated with collagen, and then um, tyrosinase, which is melanin, and then superoxide dismutase, which is the reactive oxygen species. Um, so this, the big thing about copper and is going to be associated with um, many of its pathologies is um, it's formed ceruloplasmin, which is an alpha-2 globulin. Um, and it's, this is, all in iron metabolism in transport. So that's the big thing for copper. If you have copper, you can't metabolize iron. Or not metabolize iron. You can't really um, transport it. Okay. Oh, sorry guys. So some things that are associated with copper deficiency, microcytic anemia, anytime something is associated with an anemia, microcytic or macrocytic, you need to know it. Um, they will most likely specify in the clinical vignette if it's microcytic or macrocytic and they'll, they'll just say it, they'll diagnose the patient with it, or they'll say something is wrong here. What is What would you likely see in the lab results? And so you can have micro versus macrocytic um, anemia. Um, so lysyl oxidase, you saw this back in term one, this is increased risk of bleeding and this is associated with vitamin C, right? So if you have vitamin C deficiency or if you have the, uh, oh, not vitamin C, I'm sorry, but the copper, that's the bleeding in the hemorrhage because you're not getting that collagen production. And the defects in the hair, we will go over this um, in one of the next slides with its associated pathology. So that's this one. So Menke syndrome, the thing that is going to define this patient for you is that hair is the twisty, gray, and kinky. So that should be a buzzword in any clinical vignette that they give you. Um, so it's an inherited defect in copper absorption. So you know anything in the intestine has to be absorbed properly. And if something is wrong with the receptor or the cell or what have you, you get incomplete or absorption. So that's what this is. So you're going to have low serum um, copper. It's X-linked disorder, but uh, the big thing is just that copper absorption. So the, it, the tyrosinase will give you the hair and then um, low lysyl oxidase, collagen, you are at risk for aneurysms and neurological dysfunction. You see this normally in kids. Um, and so, you know, younger kid, toddler, the um, kinky hair, you know what um, the deficiency is. Wilson's disease, this is a really big one, autosomal recessive. So you get accumulation of copper in the liver, brain, and eye. So this is going to be more transporting. So a mutation of the copper transporting AT pace. And so since you can't transport it, you are going to get an accumulation of it where you shouldn't get accumulation. So 
and it attaches um, copper to cerebroplasm and it excretes copper into the bile. So you're going to see that. Um, so this I put on here for the lab diagnoses. So you can decrease serum ceruboplasm, of course, because if you don't have available copper, you're not going to make ceruboplasm. Increase excre um, urinary excretion and they increase the powder copper content. One of the biggest things that you will see are these fleshler rings. Um, I don't know, I think it was an episode of Scrubs or something. They diagnosed Wilson's because of the copper appearance in the eye. But that is another big indicator of Wilson's. But this is for the testing purposes. This is probably just going to key you in on, oh, this is Wilson's disease. It's going to tell you in the clinical vignette. So this is just one of those things that will identify Wilson, um, copper deficiency. <laughs> Now we're talking about iron. I put a couple of things on here. So it's heme synthesis, of course. Dietary uptake is via red meat, which means that vegans have a risk of iron, <laughs> iron deficiency. He's trying to get into the chair behind me. Did you make it? Um, okay, so ferric iron is changed to ferrous in the stomach and this is what is absorbed and cerebroplasm is actually going to transport this ferrous iron that is made in the stomach and then um it's trans so that's in the intestinal cells and then it's going to pass it on to transferrin after it's made into the ferric form and then it's stored in the liver as ferritin and hemoceratin Lab tests, um, you can get two things. It can either be high or it can be low. If it's high, it's going to be an overload and you're going to hemochromatosis. Low, you're going to get an anemia. So remember, any anemia there, you really do need to pay attention to it. So if it's high hetero, he, hereditary hemochromatosis, so you have an excessive absorption, so the HFE gene. So again, if it specifies an allele or a gene, um, you need to know it. Hi, thank you. I know. I, okay. You can't climb over the chair, dude. Come here. I know. He's like a baby. Nope. We're going to get down here. Thank you. I know. Oh my God. Sorry. Um, so yeah, this is an iron overload and it's, um, the C282Y allele. So you're going to get excessive accumulation in the skin, liver, and pancreas. So the hey, clinical, Lindsay, yeah. Let me just, I was just pointing up a, a point. I put it in the chat, but just in case, um, total iron binding capacity and transfer and saturation are opposite. Okay, if it is saturated, that means the iron levels are increased, right? It's fully saturated. Total iron binding capacity is what they usually use. If that's high, that means it has additional empty seats that iron could bind. So if you have a high total iron binding capacity, that means you have a low iron, right? You have a lot of available empty spots. Okay, so they may give you a high TIBC. That would indicate that you have a low iron. That's all. Okay. Okay. So what are you going to see? The big things is the brownish pigmentation of the skin because you're depositing the iron in, go, in the different organ systems. You're going to have hepatomegaly. Um, you're going to have a cardiac dysfunction. So these are all features that they can um, tell you about in the clinical vignette to key you in on hemochromatosis and iron overload. Um, management, it's really just removal from the blood. So phlebotomy, that's the biggest one. Um, and then you can decrease your intake. So that is red meat and then high fiber content, which is going to um, reduce the absorption because it's going to promote <laughs> digestion. What in the world? Stop it. Oh my God. Sorry, guys. Stop. Shh. Okay. Iron deficiency anemia. This is a microcytic anemia. I mean, hold on. I need to go see what he's barking at. I apologize, guys. 
Uh, Brady, if you want to talk about this, you can. Sure. So remember that the uh, iron is a necessary component of heme, and heme is a necessary component to make red blood cells. So a lot of times, uh, iron deficiency anemia is uh, going to end up giving you uh, a microcytic anemia, right? Smaller, smaller red blood cells. Um, one of those weird things is this nail formation that you can see here, this brittle nail, and they have these little indentations. I suppose that's because they're actually brittle. But And you can also imagine uh, fatigue and pallor if you don't have uh, enough iron, you don't have enough red blood cells. And so you don't have that oxygen carrying capacity. So um, without that, uh, you tend to get fatigued easier. Um, some things that could lead to iron deficiency, obviously it makes sense, chronic bleeding, uh, menstruation, some sort of fibroids and GI bleeding as well can cause that. Um, yeah. I don't, I can't switch the slides. So um, we'll just have to wait. Do y'all have any questions? <laughs> Uh, anybody got a good joke? I don't know. <laughs> How are you going to bring up Drew Brees like that? That's messed up. Is the shirt in the back, Brady? I mean, you asked him for it there. <laughs> come on, come on, man. He signed it too. I'm so sad. I don't want to talk about it. Hey guys, sorry. Okay, we'll move on now. Okay, nutritional anemias. These are really big. These are really high yield. Um, honestly, you just need to know what causes what. So micro versus macro. For this exam, you don't necessarily need to know the definitions of micro versus macrocytic anemia, um, but you do need to know what causes them. So microcytic anemia, iron B6 or copper deficiencies. And so they would give you something else in the vignette. And this would just be something that is in addition to what you're seeing in the vignette. So um, they could use it to help you identify a certain deficiency or they could give you the deficiency and say, what else would you expect to see in this patient? And if it's one of these, you know, microcytic anemia is on that list um, versus macrocytic anemia, bite B12 and folate. These are huge um, for the B12, the meth methylmalinate levels elevated. This is very, very, very big. So if you see this, you'll probably have like two questions related to the methylmalinate levels um, with respect to B12. And they can also go, to, go back to the histology. And so the terminal ileum resection or the intrinsic factor, if that's deficient, that helps B12 deficiency. So they might give you that and you have to know B12, methylmalinate levels and all of that stuff rolled into one. So that's how they can incorporate a bunch of different objectives into one question. But make sure you do know these, they're pretty um, buzzwordy, high yield if you know them. Um, and then of course, folate deficiency. The difference of course between this and B12, methylmalinate levels are normal. So just know that both of these form um, macrocytic anemia. So now we will move on to D disease prevention and health promotion. I condensed this lecture heavily because you know Trotz loves, I love, oh, I love Trotz. Um, she puts a lot of information on there for your understanding. So I tried to break this down and condense it to what I remembered being really high yield and what I think you guys should focus on. So of course, Mediterranean diet, they love the Mediterranean diet. The biggest thing about this is you have more monounsaturated fatty acids. You want to decrease your saturated fatty acids and oleic acid is the big thing within the Mediterranean diet. If you see Mediterranean diet, you know, it's oleic acid. Um, how are they going to ask this question? Most likely they will give you a person that has a very poor lifestyle and diet. And they will say, what can this person change? And um, it might say something, you know, increase, decrease saturated fatty acids, include more oleic acids. So just make sure you know this. 
DHA is an omega-3. You get these from your fish contents, and this is heart and brain metabolism. That's really important. Anytime they give you an omega, omega-6, omega-3, just know which is which. That's really important. Leucine is the big amino acid for muscle growth that I pulled out of one of the slides, but I remember that being something that um, is really important. Fiber can also be one of those um, answer choices into how can this person get healthier. So fiber is water soluble. So it's going to just improve digestion, delays gastric emp emptying, slows digestion, a feeling of fullness. So this can help with increasing your um, health as well. And then antioxidants, they just protect you against reactive oxygen species. And these are some of the um, elements that can help do that. Positive versus negative nitrogen balance. This is really important. They talk about this. I think this was in one of the ER ones, one of the last ER lectures. Um, but this is directly associated with protein catabolism and anabolism. And so the um, the complete metabolism of this is going to determine your um, nitrogen balance. Your nitrogen balance is going to um, change throughout your life and throughout different disease states. So whether you're in a positive nitrogen balance or a negative nitrogen balance, positive, of course, you are going to have an increase of protein. So you're not making new, um, you're not really making new protein versus a negative nitrogen balance. This is when you are excreting a lot. And so you might have a lot of um, proteolysis. Something is happening that you are getting some protein breakdown there. Um, some, the next two on here seem really innocuous and low yield, but they, she will pull a question or two from these. And so I want you guys to look at them. Um, this one, I think turmeric was a big one that, um, they focus on because it contains curcumin, which is an antioxidant. And then, um, this also seems really innocuous but they did pull a question from here. So I um, make sure that you do look at these. Um, so just know the difference between mustard, ketchup and mayonnaise and what each one of them has. So I think, so that is really important. And then of course, I already mentioned this, but I put this on here for completion stink, dietary recommendations to reduce the risk of diseases. These are good answer choices in a MCQ that is asking how would you as a physician recommend this patient improve their quality of life, so. Now, nutrition and intensive care. This lecture kind of threw me for a loop the first time I looked at it because it's it's a lot, it's a lot. So I try to condense where I could um, to give you guys the biggest bang for your buck. So basically this is following a critical injury. So you have two phases, an ebb phase and a flow phase. The ebb phase is very short, very, very, very short. And it's immediately following the initial injury. And so it's unresuscitated. So whenever you look at the ebb phase, just know your body has not started to compensate yet. This is right after some major event happened. So um, some injury where you have a hemorrhage, so gunshot wound, stab wound, um, motor vehicle accident, anything that caused significant injury. So of course, um, okay, we'll get that to in a sec. And then the flow phase, this is after the initial injury, when your body has had time to like register itself and like, okay, now we need to get to work. So that's what that is. And then the recovery phase. So the ebb phase, Immediately following, you have hypovolemia because you're losing a lot of blood, shock, tissue hypoxia because you're not getting nutrients, you're not getting blood. Essentially, everything has um, come to a stop. So, of course, decreased cardiac output. Again, it hasn't kicked in. Those compensatory mechanisms have not taken over. So the decreased cardiac output is in direct relation to the fact that there's just not enough stuff going through there. So your decreased cardiac output, which also means you're going to have a lactic acidosis because you're not delivering oxygen to the tissues. That's what that means. So, um, anaerobic glycolysis forms lactate. Again, you're not getting blood delivery, not getting oxygen delivery. You have an anaerobic state. 
Um, so impre increased circulation also it disrupts essentially everything. So you can go through that. So you also have decreased oxygen consumption. So decreased metabolic rate, lower body temp, um, glucagon, epinephrine, and cortisol are elevated. Insulin levels are low. A few, yeah. So this is just very transient hyperglycemia proportional to, and then low insulin levels with slightly increased glucose production. So make sure um, the actual events following this, so the decreased cardiac output, that's a little intuitive, but you do need to make sure that you understand the hormone levels that are associated with these. Oh, he's playing with her. Okay. Flow phase. I tried to condense the first few slides because it repeats itself. And I think personally, I think it's confusing. So I try to condense it. So this is up to two weeks status post your injury. So this is when your body is kind of kicked in and said, oh, hey, something happened. We need to fix what happened. So of course you increase cardiac output because you're, you're really just trying to put, um, give blood to all of the areas in your body, increase body temperature. This is kind of a consequence of your increase of the next point, which is increased energy expenditure. So your metabolic rate, which is markedly increased, of course, because you are in a state of recovery. So that's going to increase your body temperature. How are you going to know this? It's measured as CO2. Why? Because you have increased oxygen consumption. If you increase oxygen consumption, you of course have more CO2. So you can measure this increased expenditure as the um, increase in CO2. And, and uh, oh, okay, step over. He's cute, but he's not the smartest puppy on the planet. And he doesn't, he ran into my cord a couple minutes ago. Oh my God. Okay. So metabolic rate is proportional to the extent of injury. This makes sense because if you just have a small injury, so you have a superficial um, stab wound, you're not going to have all of your body systems disrupted. And so your metabolic rate is only slightly going to increase versus if you have a major stab wound, major gunshot wound, major MBC, you're really going to have a, a market increase in your metabolic rate. Hold on, let me love them outside. So I'll just add this, and it's just to reiterate the point that this insulin resistance is super important, right? You have no desire. Your body doesn't need to be storing insulin during this phase, right? So this insulin resistance, even though you're in a fed state, um, the point is you, you want to have insulin resistance because you don't want to necessarily store that new glucose. You want to mobilize it. You want to use it as energy to fight the infection, to restore and repair a lot of tissue. So this is an important part of the flow phase is that you have insulin resistance. It should be noted that in type two diabetics during this phase, their insulin resistance is severely exacerbated too. Okay, so I don't really know where he picked up. But um, so increased catecholamines, glucagon, cortisol, cytokines, make sure you understand that these keep, these stay increased. So you'll notice that in the ebb phase, these are increased, these stay increased. But you also have in, increased insulin um, secretion. I'm going to go over that in my last point here, but just understand the insulin is increased. So when you are going through recovery phase, you are going to reprioritize your any energy uses for healing, which makes sense. If you have a huge injury, you want to make sure you put all of your time and energy into that side of injury. So you are going to um, kind of take it away from the peripheral, which is mu muscle and adipose. And you're going to give all of that energy to the key organs, including liver, immune system, and side of injury, of course, because you want to fix yourself, which what this means is you're going to downregulate all those receptors on the perf. Whatever. He just grabbed a towel off the table out there. I'm not dealing with that. Um, you're going to downregulate everything on those cells. That's how you do that. You can't just shunt everything away, but you can downregulate key receptors on those cells. So what does that mean? You're not going to have uptake of stuff in that area. So you have increased mobilization because you want to get those good things out into your system. So you have proteolysis lipolysis. So you have free amino acids and free fatty acids. This is important because mobilization of free fatty acids um, is going to be a marker. 
And then you, but um, your body is going to use these amino acids for gluconeogenesis. So you have hyperglycemia. So hyperglycemia in the presence of insulin is insulin resistance. Why do we have this insulin resistance? Why are not, why are our cells not taking this up? Remember, we downregulated those receptors on the peripheral tissues because we don't want those peripheral tissues using all of that good stuff that they need somewhere else. And so you don't have as many GLUT fours, you're not getting insulin uptake into those peripheral cells. So you have high insulin hyperglycemia. So you have insulin resistance just because you don't have those receptors. And that's a big thing in type two diabetes is you have the insulin resistance because those cells cannot take up that glucose. And so that's what that means. You're down regulating the receptors on non-essential areas of the body. And so you have an increase in all of these free serum products, but you also have insulin, so you have insulin resistance. So reduce glucose uptake, uptake due to the um, downregulation, but you also have increase of epinephrine, cortisol, and cytokines. Remember, these are counter-regulatory hormones, so it's going to modify the intracellular... Oh, it's going to modify the intracellular, I forgot what that stands for, but it's the intra, it's the insulin receptor. And so that's really going to kind of enhance that insulin resistance because if you have those counter-regulatory hormones in your system, they're basically saying, I don't want insulin working. So you kind of, it's kind of a double um, hit right there with respect to insulin resistance. All that to say, you get insulin resistance. Okay. So changes in carbohydrate metabolism, lactic acidosis. Remember, um, wound, so glucose is used by the injured tissue, wound and injured tissue. You're going to have anaerobic glycolysis just because you have the, you have so much um, metabolic need at that area. You're, you have oxygen consumption, increasing CO2. So you have anaerobic glycolysis in this area, which is going to increase lactate, which is going to recycle to the Cori cycle. Um, so this is basically all I just said before. So poor tissue oxygenation, you're going to get the inner glycolysis. Poor blood flow also impedes Cori cycle. Because remember, we're in a state of um, fixing yourself. So uh, uh, even though we're upping everything, it's still not to that 100%. So you still have the poor blood flow impeding the Cori cycle. You have lactic acidosis because you don't have good oxygenation, but lactic acidosis is an indicator of poor, poor prognosis. Highlight this. This is a really big one. I'm pretty sure it was in, in a question on the exam. Oh, no. But because uh, you have lactic acidosis and it continues, you're going to have lactic, lactic acidosis. But if it continues, that's a it, poor prognosis because it means your body isn't fixing itself. Because once your body starts to fix itself, you are going to have good blood flow and you are going to have good oxygenation. And so if you continue lactic acidosis chronically, that's poor prognosis. So if you monitor that, it can be an indicator of if your patient is... Um, if your patient is healing well. And then high anion gap metabolic acidosis. This is bolded in red. Highlight this. This is really important. This is just something you need to know. Okay. Brady mentioned diabetics here. Diabetics in the flow phase, remember they already have insulin resistance. They already have a, um, a compromised state. So this is going to be difficult to regulate blood glucose because you're just adding to everything. You're adding to hyperglycemia, you're adding to the insulin resistance. And so you can have this hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. And we're going to, we're going to talk a lot about this when we talk about the diabetic um, differences, but this is something that can happen when you have some kind of injury or acute illness, you kind of send them over the edge and they get this hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. We're going to talk about that more in a bit. Um, type one diabetics have ketoacidosis following injury. Why everything we just talked about you. Um, and so they're not going to respond to the normal doses because of this added insulin resistance. So basically, if you are in this acute state, you're just going to have worsening of diabetes all over the place because of those mobilization of energy stores leading to gluconeogenesis, leading to hyperglycemia. So it's really just going to push these diabetics over the edge. And that is something that you really need to um, look at in these states. So comparison, carbohydrate, 
um, critical illness versus prolonged starvation. So this is different because the body is in a different state. If you are in a critical illness, it's going to increase because you have the mobilization of all the stores. But prolonged starvation, it's going to be decreased because it's just, you just don't have it there. It's not that you aren't um, backtrack. Um, critical illness, everything is there. You're just mobilizing everything versus starvation. You are not giving yourself the nutrients that your body wants. Insulin levels high, you have insulin resistance, low because um, in the prolonged starvation. Energy for the brain, it's going to be glucose. Energy for the brain, glucose plus ketone bodies. And so um, you can just go through this. Changes in lipid metabolism. I already told you that you're going to have lipolysis. Um, so you're gonna have this free fatty acids. And so why are you getting this? Cause you have an increase in epinephrine, cortisol, and this is gonna activate those uh, hormone sensitive lipase. And so that's, what's going to do the lipolysis. So that's why you're getting the lipid metabolism because of that increase in epinephrine and cortisol. Um, something big in this state, ketosis is not observed. They call that blunted effect. So that's something in this flow phase that you need to take note of. Um, why? Because insulin inhibits ketogenesis. That's also something that Brady hinted at with respect to type one versus type two diabetics. And we'll talk about that later, but ketogenesis is in inversely reportable propor proportional to the severity of the injury. There we go. Lipid metabolism, um, you can read through this, the difference between the flow phase and prolonged starvation. Protein catabolism, you are going to go into a negative nitrogen balance. Why? Because of proteolysis. Proteolysis, you're breaking down the proteins, you're increasing um, blood urea um, nitrogen. And this means that you're in a negative nitrogen balance. To be in a positive nitrogen balance, you have to be putting that into your body, the amino acids, the protein into your body and building it up. Um, but we are in a negative, nitro ni uh, negative nitrogen balance. Okay, protein, we talked about this, proteolysis. Um, so you're gonna have reduced protein synthesis, of course, because we are using this for, um, so reduced synthesis and uptake. So both, re because remember, we're shunting stuff away from peripheral and this includes the muscle. So the muscle is not a priority right now. So that's why we are having reduced synthesis and amino acid uptake. Um, you are going to have an increase in you in urine urea excretion. Why? Because we have the increased proteolysis, and so it get and we're not uptaking it back into the muscles. So it has nowhere to go if it's not used for gluconeogenesis. Then we can excrete it um, in the urine. It'll go through the urine cycle in the urine. Okay, uses of amino acids following proteolysis. So again, you're gonna use this for gluconeogenesis. This is a big thing that we've been talking about. Um, and so you have increased nitrogen loss, maintaining the immune system, and then you have acute phase proteins in the liver, which we'll talk about in a sec. Um, so the big thing after all of this, you need, need, need nutritional support for, um, a patient like after surgery, after one of, after a big acute event, because their body is using all of these things like crazy. So it's breaking stuff down. It's using it. And so you need to supplement that or else your patient is really going to kind of waste away because you keep breaking down all of these stores. You need to build those back up. Vitamins and minerals, of course, we all know that vitamins, minerals, cofactors, all of these things are needed for the maintenance of all of these things. So it's really important that patients in these states have increased vitamin intake so that um, the increased uh, healing, uh, you get it. Acute phase response proteins, um, acute phase proteins are made in the liver. Um, these are, these just signal inflammation. That's really all it does. So you have CRP, alpha one, alpha one antitrypsin, seroloplasmin, um, heptoglobin. All of these things are just kind of a response to inflammation. Um, so it's kind of mediated by the immune system right here. 
So these are markers of inflammation. So CRP is something that's very commonly tested for to see if a patient is in an inflammatory state. So albumin is a negative phase acute, acute phase protein because you it's going to be down regulated in this state. Um, so these can also be a marker of the progress and prognosis of the patient because if you continue to have these acute phase proteins, that means your inflammatory process is ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. If you do see a, um, a if you do see a patient healing, these are eventually going to go down and they're going to normalize because your body is kind of resolving the inflammation and it's resolving the acute event. And so um, they should go down. Excess protein catabolism, remember we talked about um, if you just keep using at these stores, everything where you took it is going to suffer from this. So extent, extensive visceral protein breakdown. So you have a compromised ability to adapt. So it's going to, um, so if you deplete all this, you're going to have poor wound healing. We need this for wound healing, but remember you have to supplement all of this so that you can still get the wound healing immune system, gut mucosal breaker. So all of these things need protein. That's why you get the proteolysis in these acute events. But if you don't supplement all of that and you have, and you deplete your stores, and you don't um, replete them kind of exogenously, you get a lot of bad stuff. So um, this is just the difference between flow phase and starvation. So you can go through that. The biggest thing um, is the negative nitrogen balance. Just make sure that you understand that people in an acute, after an acute injury, um, they are in a negative nitrogen balance. So this is just a kind of summary of everything that's going to happen in the flow phase. You can go through that. We kind of talked about that already. Anabolic recovery, um, positive nitrogen balance, of course, because you're building everything up. So difference between positive and negative nitrogen balance, that's important. So just know that. Now, changes during diabetes mellitus. So of course we talked about type one versus type two. It's really important to understand the difference. Type one, you have a destruction of the beta cells in the pancreas. So you're not making insulin versus type two where your beta cells are just fine. You're making insulin, but there's something wrong with the receptor. And so you can't utilize the insulin that you have. So Type one, this is going to be more associated with younger people and um, you, they usually come in and they're young, they're skinny. It's a very different picture from what you would stereotypically think of as a diabetic patient. Whereas type two, this is more, you, you can induce this in your life and you have them, it's very associated with obesity. And this is in, um, it can be like, 20s, 30s, but it increases as you get older. So insulin dependent versus non-insulin dependent. So make sure you understand the difference between those two. So the triad here, polyphagia, polydipsia, polyuria, increase hunger, increase thirst, increase urination. These are the things that are going to tell you in a clinical vignette that yes, your patient has diabetes. Um, weight loss is observed. This is more due to type one because of the accelerated lipolysis and proteolysis. Remember we said these people are more skinny, type ones are more skinny, which is what you would not think of a diabetic patient because you associate it with more with, um, type two. Um, but all of them are going to have hyperglycemia. Every single one of them are hyperglycemia. So that's a big thing. So why are we hyperglycemic? So, um, in an uncontrolled diabetic, the ratio, the insulin glucagon ratio, and we talked a lot about that with all of the, um, biochemical pathways, the ratio is messed up. And so in diabetics, this ratio is really low. So you have uh, key gluconeogenic enzymes are activated because you have high glucagon. So you get Pepsi-K, which is going to be gluconeogenesis, pyruvic carboxylase, um, um, f 16 bisphosphatase. So all of these things, you are going to get gluconeogenesis. And, but you get gluconeogenesis, 
but the uh the GLUT fours. This is remember this is the big one. The deficiency of insulin results in decreased number of GLUT fours. So you get the increase, you get hyperglycemia due to gluconeogenesis. Then you're not even getting it into your tissues, and so those GLUT fours are downregulated. You don't have this going on. So why do we have polyuria? So this is excessive urination. So glucose is going to be completely reabsorbed in the renal tubule. But, uh, so it should be absent in the normal person. So in that um, proximal convoluted tubule, you know, 100% of glucose is reabsorbed. That's what's supposed to happen. But in hyperglycemia, you're going to overload the kidney. You're going to overload the neuron. And so you can't get it back into the system. You're going to overload the reabsorptive capacity. And we're going to talk a lot about this in subsequent slides. Glucose is osmotically active. And so that's going to, that's going to contribute to a lot of the things you're going to see in this disease process. But since it is osmotically active, active, it's going to hold water. So it's osmotic diuresis, which is also why you get increased thirst because you are getting a lot of water loss in the urine due to this hyperglycemic state overloading the capacity to reabsorb at the level of the nephron. So this is kind of, this is just the overview they gave you. So you have increased gluconeogenesis and the reduced glute, reduced glute 4. You get the hyperglycemia. You're going to overload the kidney. So, um, which is, and glucose is osmotically active. So it's going to pull the water with it. You're going to get polyuria. You're going to get polydipsia. Um, and all of these things um, are going to lead to um, that. And then you, it, dehydration is something we're going to talk about in subsequent slides. Complications. Of course, this is not good that we have the hyperglycemic state. So chronic, you're going to micro and mass, macrovascular changes. Acute, you can have keto, ketoacidosis, hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic state, and then um, hypoglycemia if you treat it and if it's inadequate or um, not inadequate, but the treatment is has not been calibrated to that patient. So ketoacidosis, what is this? Um, I put this case on here. We're not going to go through the intricacies of this. The big thing is you need to know the fruity odor. That is a buzzword that they can use. I don't remember them having us actually figure out it was ketoacidosis from an ABG. Brady, do you remember? I don't, they told us, it, you, there was enough in the vignette, you knew it was ketoacidosis. You didn't have to look at the ABG and actually figure it out on your own. But um, no, the biggest- No, no. But the biggest thing you need to understand is this is a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. And that was one of the things that you guys talked about in CPR too, is this is an example. DKA is an example of high anion gap metabolic acidosis. So know how to um, recognize it. Know it's um, a high anion gap metabolic acidosis and you should be good. And then it's... Um, so effects of hyperglycemia kind of continued. Remember we talked about how glucose is an osmotic uh, molecule. And so where it goes, water is going to go with it. So you can get coma in extreme hyperglycemic states because of this osmotic effect. So it pulls water out of the neuro neural area. So if you're, you have neuronal dehydration, which is extremely bad, coma, you have general dehydration um, because of the polyuria, poly, uh, so you are peeing off a lot and it's taking, um, the glucose is taking the water with it. Something that's really big and you really have to look out for in these patients is hyperkalemia because this insulin, it, or not insulin, you are going to move the calcium, not calcium, I'm sorry, potassium from the ICF to the ECF, to the extracellular fluid, and you get subsequent loss in urine. So this is a really big thing and it's really dangerous um, because hyperkalemia leads to a lot of bad stuff, including um, heart defects and arrhythmias that can lead to cardiac arrest. Now, hey, something Lynn. that you- Hey, Lindsay, can, I just want to <clears throat> elaborate on that a little bit. So, for example, if you if if you want to get a malpractice suit in the hospital, 
you would you could give insulin without potassium. It is a rule in the hospital. If you ever give somebody insulin, you always give them potassium. And this will help you understand the concept. So remember, potassium is primarily intracellular. If you're in a state where you have low insulin, all right, the potassium is going to move from intracellular to extracellular, okay? Now, when you check the lab values, um, you always check the extracellular fluid, right? You can't actually check the intracellular fluid. So when you check the lab values, it's going to say that patient is hyperkalemic. You always correlate whatever you find in the extracellular to what you would expect on the intracellular fluid. So it would look like that patient is hyperkalemic because all of the potassium went to the extracellular fluid, okay? The problem is the second you give them insulin, so you look at their labs, it says, looks like they have hyperkalemia. I'm not gonna give them potassium. You just give them insulin. The second you give them insulin, all the potassium rushes into the cell and come to find out they actually have severe hypokalemia. So they end up with cardiac arrhythmias. So anytime you give insulin in the hospital, you always give potassium with it, even if the labs show that they're hyperkalemic. So this is a really important test point that they like to test on board exams just because it's so clinically relevant. Yeah, and so he basically just talked about the next point. So they can become hypokalemic upon insulin injection because it shifts it back into the ICF. Um, so just make sure you understand that. Um, but thank you, Brady. And then a big thing is the hyperosmotic hyperglycemic state, which I mentioned back when we were talking about acute injury. This is more common in type two diabetics, and this is very high yield. Highlight that type two diabetics. This is when you're going to see the hyperosmol or hypoglycemic state. Um, so you have hypovolemia due to polyuria and then just general dehydration. And then ketones are not significant because there is still insulin present, present which that's supposed to be an H. I'll um, fix that when I send it out to you guys, um, which inhibits ketogenesis. And then it's not associated with metabolic acidosis. And then of course we talked about coma due to intracellular dehydration of the neurons, but make sure you do know about this hyperosmotic hyperglycemic state. Okay. So some of the chronic complications, um, this is due to hyperglycemia. This leads to micro and micro, micro and macro vascular complications. So some of the micro vascular changes, so you neuropathy, nephropathy, retinopathy. And so neuropathy, a lot, this is why diabetic patients will come in with tingling or numbness in their feet. And that's why diabetics get, um, non-healing wounds is in they can't feel them because they get a tiny tiny little nick they don't know it's there and it just and because they're 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 immunocompromised essentially because of the state and so you get poor wound healing you don't know it's there it keeps getting aggravated and aggravated and aggravated and that's why you see so many um like toe and foot amputations because of this neuropathy. You just don't know it's there. And then nephropathy, because you're overloading the glomeruli with this, um, with the glucose. And so you can get um, nephropathy. And then retinopathy, um, we'll talk about that in a second, I believe. So this is gonna occur in, in tissues that do not require insulin for glucose. It, uh, for glucose entry. So again, non-insulin dependent, um, this is going to, so the, the adipose, the muscle, all of these require insulin. They're insulin dependent. Those loop fours are insulin dependent. These are non-insulin dependent. And so glucose can kind of freely enter into these areas. So if it's high, that can be bad. So mechanisms of complication, um, Sorbitol formation. So in the retina, you have the present presence of the aldolase reduct. Yeah, that's on one of the subsequent slides. But if you get high glucose, you can also get the sorbitol formation. And then that's what causes the cloudiness in the eyes. Um, we're going to, we have a separate slide for this, but make sure that you understand microvascular complications. So sorbitol, in the lens, nerve and kidneys, remember non-insulin dependent uptake formed because it's osmotically active. You get um, swelling due to water retention, aldose reductase. That's what I thought it was. I was trying to 
remember what it was. Um, directly related to plasma glucose levels. The big thing on this, know the enzyme, know that it's sorbitol and know what it does. That's the takeaway from this slide. Um, advanced glycation end products. So this is what you, um, you, you commonly hear the glycation with the HbA1c, and this is kind of similar to that. So it's a non-enzymatic addition of glucose to um, intra and extra cellular proteins. Um, just understand what that these are, that they are a thing and what they do. So they can lead to their cross-linking of the glycated proteins, and then they are going to impair function. So this, if you're, if you're cross-linking these functions, these proteins, that's going to lead to dysfunction simply for the fact that they are going to deposit in these places and cause um, mechanical damage in the areas. Oh, and then more prone to oxidative damage as well. So microvascular compl complication. So we talked about this, but ulcers, these are painless. So neuropathy, painless, peripheral vascular disease are common factors. Then you get um, increased loss of albumin and urine in the initial stages. So this is going to be the earliest indicator of the diabetic involvement. Um, the DAG pathway is so you're increasing DAG, which is activating the PKC and activating the PKC is going to lead to transcription of a bunch of stuff. So you're going to get changes. Um, hexosamidase pathway, he he oh my God, hexosamine <laughs> pathway. This wasn't super high yield. Now the macrovascular complications, this is a really big one too. You would get accelerated atherosclerotic changes. Um, so you're leading to heart disease because you know that diabetes is a fast track to cardiac problems because of all of the changes that happen um, kind of end stages of disease. So hypertriglyceridemia, <laughs> So increase in the triglycerides, you have increased chylomicrons, VLDL, so all of these bad things. And then you have a decrease of the LPL, lipolipate, li lipoprotein lipase. Um, so you can also get hypertension, dyslipidemia, hypercoagulability, all of these fun things. HbA1c, you really just need to know that this is going to um, results from the poorly controlled glucose that 6.5% um, or higher is the big thing. And then laboratory tests um, for long term management. Uh, the HbA1c is a big one. The dyslipidemia is a big one. So the fasting lipid profile. And then, of course, you need to, you need to, need to, need to, this is more of a soapbox than anything, um, monitor renal function because a big thing with uncontrolled hypertension and diabetes leads to renal failure. I saw so many people in the ED coming in for dialysis due to renal failure secondary to uncontrolled hypertension and diabetes. It's, it's not just a, um, you know, genetic issue, like uncontrolled diabetes. It, it's terrible what it does to your kidney. So um, that's more of a soapbox than anything. <laughs> but um, then comparing the two, make sure you do know the differences. Type one, you're going to see in early childhood, they're going to, um, uh, genetic predisposition is pretty moderate. And then beta cells destroyed, you are going to get the ketosis, remember, because you're not getting the insulin and insulin is going to inhibit ketosis. And so that's not here. So you are going to get ketosis. Um, plasma insulin, of course, low. And then type 2 diabetes is going to be older. Um, mostly you're going to see obese patients. You are not really going to see ketosis for the reasons we mentioned before. The complications, hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic state, no keto, no DKA versus this, type one versus type two. Um, but that is it. So, <clears throat>
Yeah, that's a lot. But um, what we can do now is um, we can answer any questions. It could be anything for DM. We'll do our best to answer them. If not, we could try and look them up. So if y'all have any burning desire to ask questions, uh, now would be the time. I was not looking at the chat at all during that. Uh, I got it. Yeah, we're good. I just had a general question about sort of the interplay between activating and deactivating hormone sensitive lipase and then lipoprotein lipase under different influences and how they do different things. Are you talking about that question that was in lecture? Yeah, I think so. And then there was also a practice. Don't class. even, don't even worry about it. I, I, okay, so somebody <laughs> sent me that and I was pissed off. So I made them sit because it was a terrible, written, terribly written question. So I was like, let me hear what the teacher said. So they sent me what the teacher said. And I was like, not only was that a bad question, that was a bad explanation. Okay, but I'll tell you how my understanding and um, I don't know if this is 100% right, but this is how I understand it, right? So that patient in the question was a type two diabetic, right? So the insulin levels will be elevated. They just won't respond to it. So the insulin, um, but over time, and this is what this is what wasn't specified in the question, over time, they actually do get um, a burnout of the beta cells. So you get actually a decreased insulin. So they get like type one response to it. So by decreasing the insulin, you're going to decrease the, um, the amount of lipoprotein lipase because lipoprotein lipase is on the insulin's team with the storage form. But the reason that A was wrong, which had to do with hormone sensitive lipase is because in the presence of insulin, um, hormone sensitive lipase will be inhibited. That was the best I could get from it. And I did try to look it up, but honestly, it was a really bad question and a really bad explanation too from yeah, the teacher. I thought that they also simultaneously said that when someone's insulin resistant, they will have hormone sensitive lipase activated by way of like epinephrine or something. So that's why that totally threw me off. Yeah, and you know, like the guy, the question had the guy was like five years in. So like, if you're type two diabetic and you're five years in, I don't really feel like you've burnt out the beta cells to like to where you're you're decreasing insulin secretion along with the insulin resistance. But um, I, I see what you're saying, but I think the idea for the reason why hormone sensitive light based, like whenever I think of an I think of a situation where insulin is present, I always feel like hormone sensitive light base is inactivated just because they're counter, they're counter each other. Hormone sensitive lipase is breaking stuff down, whereas insulin is telling you to build stuff up, right? Anabolic. So um, yeah, uh, I did try to listen to that. And it was, I just think, um, just, just make sure you kind of, you just keep lipo, uh, lipoprotein for the test. I don't think it'll be that convoluted. Keep lipoprotein lipase and hormone sensitive lipase just, just opposite each other, obviously. Awesome, thanks so much. No worries. I will Hi. try to get it, oh, excuse me. I'll try to get it uploaded um, as soon as possible. It takes a little while for it to process and then I have to get it up to YouTube. So I'll get it up as soon as I can. Yeah, go ahead. So I have a question from the 700 question pack. It's on, okay, so it says, where did it go? So it says, which of the following is true of the cephalic response to a meal? And the answer was, it is prevented by vagotomy. Why? Oh. <laughs> uh, by what? By a vagotomy. Oh, a so like oh, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, uh, the vagus nerve is, uh, so if you, if you clip the vagus nerve, some, I guess sometimes they do that if there's like, like severe GERD or something like that. So you can clip the vagus nerve that's descending. So you're gonna decrease the acetylcholine that's responded. Uh, so the cephalic phase, uh, when you're thinking about food and you salivate, you actually do get acetylcholine release. So if you, uh, if you cut the vagus nerve, have a vagotomy, um, you can actually um, decrease the acetylcholine. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Was that the whole question? No, yeah, that was the whole thing. And then okay. the other 
another one that was like similar was um, which of the following abolishes the receptive relaxation of the stomach? And it was the same thing, same answer, like biophagotomy. But like, I don't remember, you know, like seeing that in lectures that if you do this, it will cause this. So like, is that something that would be tested on? Just keep in mind that the cephalic phase has to do with the vagus nerve uh, releasing acetylcholine. That kind of gets okay. things going when you smell food, when you see food, when you think about food. The one thing okay. I will say is they mentioned that the vagus nerve um, helps control peristaltics as okay. well. So yeah. it would make sense that for that second question, uh, a vagotomy would lead to, you know, help out with that. Got yeah, it. That makes Thank sense. You. Um, I question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I just have a follow up question for her. Is there why would there be a vagotomy for the distal part of the stomach versus the ORAD part of the stomach? That was also in the 700 question. And I would think um, you have, and that would resolve it. Yeah, I'm not sure. I guess if you if you isolate, I think this is a bit more detail than we need to worry about. But if you isolate the area that's having the, the increased release of the acid or whatever um, from the vagus nerve, then you can do it. But I thought they did it kind of uh, before you get to the stomach, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I don't think they'll ask you something that detailed. Uh, okay, thanks. And do you know why a vagotomy would give you a sense of satiety? I never well, understood it, that. Well, okay, so if you think about the idea that the vagus nerve is sending down, the cephalic phase, the vagus nerve is sending a acetylcholine to make you hungry, if you if you eliminate that response, you're 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 eliminating the idea that you, or the 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 feeling that you're hungry, so to make you feel, so, you know, the say satiety, right? Say it. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So that like it it just counteracts or inhibits that. Okay. So question: the inhibitors of the electron transport train are really uh, chain train. Yeah, the electron transport chain are really important, actually. You'll get, you'll get a couple of questions of those. So know which ones go to which, which complex. Definitely know the uncouplers, the ionophores, uh, and all those at the end, um, and kind of like a, a little definition of the mechanism of action. For sure, that's definitely, that'll definitely be tested. Yeah, first aid has good stuff with that. But caveat, first aid doesn't have everything that, that Dr. Mage had. So um, keep that in mind. Mostly um, those little, they're not all acronyms, but the like cutesy way of remembering those, you'll have a few questions from there, but there were one or two that Dr. May had that were not in first aid. My brain associated that simply because I didn't see it in first aid. I was like, oh, that's something that is different, but, but you will get, they are easy questions if you memorize them. They're easy questions and there'll be a, a handful of them. Yeah, the drugs tend to be straightforward. It's just kind of, you know it or you don't, for sure. Uh, no, like- ETP, I feel like only with respect to differences. So if you were to have anaerobic respiration or- the difference between the shuttles, because if something's turned off, it's going to um, do something different with that. So that's the most important thing is if you see something that is different, but with respect to just main glycolysis, main um, TCA, lipolysis and all that stuff, I don't remember that being a huge thing. No, and no, like, no, the downstream effects. So like the idea of having ATP will help to inhibit glycolysis, right? But that makes sense because the idea of glycolysis is to make ATP. So it's a feedback mechanism. So things like that'll be super important. I would know on the Krebs cycle, which steps like you get GTP, which steps you get NADH or NA, yeah, NADH and then FADH too, like know those. But other than that, I think, I think you'd be good to go. I have another question, sorry. Yep. No worries. So um, it's also on the 700 packet. It says that during the first few microseconds of muscle contraction, a high energy compound directly forms ATP in the muscle. Which enzyme performs this function? And the answer was creatine kinase, but there was also pyruvate kinase and 
um, mitochondrial ATP synthase, glyceraldehyde, three phosphate dehydrogenase, and succinate thiokinase. So why would it be creatine? Yeah, I think that's a little more detailed than we need to get into, um, but creatine okay. kinase, it, it is specific to the muscle. So I would, I honestly would have to look into it to get more detail about it. But creatine is a supplement people take to, for muscle building, but it is, it is specific to the muscles. So um, I would, and it is a high energy compound. Uh, so creatine kinase would make sense to make that. But to be honest with you, I'd have to, I'd have to look it up. Okay. So it's not something I should stress no, about. I, would, I okay. wouldn't stress that at all. Thank you to that though the because they made sure to bring it up in one of my um, small groups is that creatine phosphate is the storage form of creatine in the muscle so and it's only used in the first few seconds of contraction so we obviously need that creatine kinase to take it off right so yeah i mean that makes sense yeah, right yeah active and usable yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so like creatine is like um, like phosphoenopyruvate, things like that, that are, if you remember the scale, I think it was on like the, uh, the Delta G, those those energy, that, that lecture where you looked at the different stages and like a, where ATP sat, like creatine is, is more powerful or has more energy built up. And even ATP. So that would make sense that creatine phosphate uh, is an energy form in the muscle. And apparently, as was stated, uh, it's used in the first few seconds of the muscle contraction, right? Any other questions? Thank you, guys. I hope you have good luck. Yeah, Rest good luck, y'all. You're going to do better than you think you are. I promise you. Like I was, I had about three or four mini anxiety attacks the week leading up to the exam, but I did much better than I thought I did. And it was funny because our test was on like a Thursday or a Friday and they take four business days to release. And so since it was the weekend, it just added to that. And I kept having dreams of getting my exam back. And in every single one of my dreams, my exam grade got lower and lower and lower and lower until I convinced myself that I had failed this exam. But I was pleasantly surprised when I got my grade. So just make sure um, you do just take a deep breath, relax. So yeah, the only exam that was curved for us was in B1. That was the yeah. only curve. We had a nice uh, 10 point curve on that bad boy, but that was all we had. Anyway, we'll be available over the weekend. If y'all uh, have a question, just shoot us a message. Um, but that being said, I'll get the video posted uh, as soon as I can. So good luck guys. We'll talk to y'all later. Bye.